I just click it, and it goes right to the stream to Facebook. What's up, everybody? The Paprika Podcast uh, show. My name is David Hewlett, and I am here on this glorious Friday. It's a little weird, actually. We got humidity. It's been, it rained. It had, like, a weird thunderstorm. Mm-hmm. We're, we're catching a tail that was a Hurricane Ida down in Florida. I don't know. Anyway, here we are, boom, with Ray Love, hook up with a house. On Instagram, and Ray Love is uh, uh, one of my favorite people and Thank comedians you. out here in the scene. <clears throat> and you, up until recently, were running the show with Jay Coldwater, who was on an earlier episode uh, at Pizza Melody. You guys were hosting that mic with uh, karaoke and yes. it was karaoke and open mic comedy. Jokey Okey. And Jokey Okey, and it kept the comedian, the comedy kept the comedians there, and the comedians kept the singers there and people would wait for their songs so they listen to some comedy and the food was really good I yes mean, and then that guy that guy renovated and decided to mix it up a little bit I guess yes <clears throat> so yeah because the original plan was to have, have uh, Jay on then have you on and okay. then uh, I, I guess now we got you I'm collecting comedians like Pokemons okay and wow I, then I put y'all on different teams okay put you on right. uh, the show so since y'all host a show together get you individual okay and then put you on your own okay cool. your own thing so we'll get Jay in here with you yes sir <clears throat> next time yes sir I want to do a golf episode with uh, Trez Mala Dan, oh. Dan Hall yeah they play golf and Steve Henry Okay, yeah. They all play golf together, so. Yeah, I know they do. <clears throat> but man, I was up. Uh, I was up uh, way too late last night. I'm exhausted. Wow. Uh, I'm still, and I still plan on trying to go to this. Uh, we'll, we'll see how much energy I got when we're done. I was going to go back to a jiu-jitsu open mat and try wow. and, <laughs> and try and uh, get my sea legs back a little bit. Oh, uh, wow. I don't know, man. I might need to rest. We'll see. Damn, jiu-jitsu. Whew. See, that, that's why I know I, um. Uh, I, I was going to go to Ocho. I was kind of tired because I know I had to get up and yeah. I was be early for this. And I, and, and I get up one through Wednesday and then Friday I train, you know, work out. Yeah. So I want to have energy for that because when I went to Ocho, I was, I went to bed at like four and I was tired. Yeah. And I got up at, at like seven. I was like, oh shit, I ain't getting no rest. Yeah, it's, it's so late. I just saw a thing online that said that if you get five hours of sleep, it totally changes your, <clears throat> totally changes your like testosterone profile. Like, yeah, your hormones and everything. It's something like it takes like ten years off your life or something. I don't know. I never understood how they they find that stat. Where they're like, yeah. oh, every I, I want every cigarette takes, you know, takes ten minutes off your life or whatever it is. Ten minutes. <laughs> or you, if you heard that, like you would say, oh, every time you get drunk, you lose a month. Or something. I'm like, how do they know that is this these... a pregnant woman, a woman who on oh, the time of the month you lose a month? What's yeah. she on a period? I don't know. It's it's like I, I think it's like um, you know they don't know if that alcoholic was gonna get eaten by a bear, facts or whatever. They don't know how how people are gonna die or when. And right. then then you always hear the story of the, the like oh my grandma she drank a whole bottle of whiskey yeah, yeah, yeah. every day she didn't be 93 and yeah, all that she outlived all her doctors or whatever <laughs> he told her to stop. But uh, yeah. Anyway, so I don't I don't know what that is, but I could use some more sleep. I know. Uh, I, know I know the fit man. Because we did Ocha yesterday, and then after Ocha, Ocha starts at eleven. Yeah. Oof. And then I, I, we, for whatever reason, I don't think we got out of there till like three. Oh my God! See. You know. And then then we went to uh, Dino's to hang out, and because the comedians and like. There's oh, these these weird pockets of people that go hang out at Dino's on Thursdays like at two three in the morning. Because you always see the same people, but we're right down the road, so we just go uh, over there. If we get there early enough, we'll do some karaoke. Otherwise, we just kind of hang out uh, before him when everyone's too tired to. Because they don't really close. It's one of those Vegas dive bars. Oh uh, yeah. Have you yeah. been there? Have you been to Dino's? Uh, Dino's I know Dino's Lounge. Is that? I know Dino's. Is that. <clears throat> yeah, right. It's right across from that new strip club, the Peppermint Hippo, which is in a weird spot <laughs> because that that's like a well, it's where OGs was. Oh, okay. Olympia, now, Dino's is where? Isn't it right by Ocha? Yeah, you go to Ocha, and then you go back up the boulevard towards the Stratosphere. Okay, yeah, And yeah. it's, yeah, it's pretty much, it's, I think it's kind of like halfway between. Okay. It's like, because you go a little bit in either direction, you get to either Ocha or you get to yeah. the Stratosphere. Okay. 
It's right there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a weird location though, but that that whole area, of Las Vegas, between the Stratosphere and Fremont Street on Las Vegas Boulevard, mm-hmm. is just a very. That's where those weird wedding chapels are. Like, yes. hey, you get married by a tiny Elvis, <coughs> right? Yeah. Or, you know, then they have a bunch of hostels, and there's a bunch of uh, hostel people. Oh, there's, no. You know, with Ocha is w- weird because it's a good restaurant, mm-hmm. but it's in a neighborhood where you will have like crazy. You know, crazy drunk guy, you know, just walk in and be like, ah, I'm here now. They're like, no, you, you got to be somewhere else. So they, they, we had altercations there. Hey. I mean, there was a crackhead punch Johnny Brim. Oh, yeah, I heard During about the that. show, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Ty always keeps the cameras on in case something crazy happens. Wow. That's a location where something crazy happens a lot. Yeah, yeah. And he yelled, he yelled at somebody the other day. Um, well, he yelled at somebody last night at the show. It was... Who, who did he t- yell at? Who did he yell at? He yelled at this girl who I I don't think... She is a girl who was hanging out with Diaz. Uh-huh. And so she would come down on... Like, because Diaz does his show in Henderson on, right. this, on Thursdays also. But he does it in Henderson. So And then he does a whole podcast after his show wraps. Oh, okay. So it's, then he'll load up a few people and he'll get down there and all of a sudden like four or five people will come in with with Diaz and then Diaz usually closes the Ocha show he's right, one yeah. of those combo uh, who, 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 um, <clears throat> who won last night last yeah. night Linda Marcus Smith won and uh, uh, yeah she won a hundred uh, well they split it they gave two where it was Linda Marcus Smith and it's this uh, this African fellow uh, he's uh, he was at Champagnes on Tuesday. Nice okay. guy. He's got some funny jokes. Uh, he did good. It was a weird. It was weird energy for the room. Like, cause I was telling you earlier, like Vegas is so dry and so hot all the time. Yeah. And right now we're in the like it's shifting over to to winter, right? So we're kind of in fall, mm-hmm. and so the weather is cooler. And then it just rained. We got a touch Man. of that hurricane from Florida or whatever. I don't know what it is, but we got. Some crazy rain for like three hours yesterday, or Man. something like that, and so we got like weird humidity around. So it wasn't like I I think people just are less likely to want to go out and get nuts on days like that. But anyway, yeah, we had we had that, and Ty yelled at this girl because she had stepped on his shoes. <laughs> I guess the week before he had bought these brand new white shoes, Uh-oh. and this girl came up to talk to him, and she stepped on his shoes and got him dirty. And then he yelled at her, and she freaked out and started trying to, to wipe his shoes off. And then she just made him messier. She was wiping them up, and he got extra mad at her. Don't touch my shoes, bitch. I'm yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's what happened. And then, and, then oh, he she came salty, over, huh? and then she came over and tried to, like, I guess, like, tried to be cooler with him than he because he was like oh that's that bitch that fucked up my shoes I don't want to talk to her and then she came right up to him <laughs> and wow. she was trying to get trying to be cool or she was extra like uh, I think she was really young like 21 or something like that oh, like okay. she did and so she wasn't used to like Ty is a um, you know he's a he's a unique snowflake so if you don't yeah. know if, if you don't have the life experience to sort of you know Say okay, I'm not going to assume this is anything. Like, well, who is it? especially comedians, right? Because a lot of comedians are we we all we all look different. Yeah, you very yeah. But we all have the same. It's like I don't care where you're from, what you look like, how old you're. None of that matters. It's comedy. Are you a comedian? Okay, cool. You're in the club. Right. Unless you're, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I don't like being around you. You know what I, mean? I, I I I feel you. But there's that extra level, you know, and it's sort of like it's it's sort of like the idea of a gay bar, but with way more diversity. Where a gay bar is like, like, look, we all get we all been picked on our whole lives, so this is a place for us to go, and nobody gets. That's the rule. That's the one rule. No one gets picked on. Right. Right. Like nobody gets picked on for real. Like right. we can, we're here to, to dance right. and party and be as whatever we are. Exactly. And comedy is a lot like that, mm-hmm. but. Uh, I feel like there's more of a there's less of a vetting process for comedy because like there are some real psychos that will try to be comedians too and oh all you gotta do is God, show up and sign up. 
Yeah. But Ray, let's. Uh, it's not about. Uh, well, oh, so check out Ocha Tai. But let's talk about Ray Love. Uh, give a little background. Uh, where you're from? Who are you? And uh, how do you find yourself? What are you up to here in town? <clears throat> talk okay. about you know comedy and show. Sure, sure, sure. Well, uh, how did Ray Love come to be? Well, Ray Love came to be. You know, uh, both my beautiful parents were both deceased. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Raymond William Colbert Sr., who I'm named after. My, my government name is Raymond William Colbert Jr. I'm named after my father, Raymond William Colbert Sr. May he rest in peace. Uh, born and raised on the south side of Chicago. Grew up in this suburb called Markham, Illinois, and on the south side of the Wild Hundreds of Chicago. Uh, Go ahead and angle that mic so it's pointed, okay. it's pointed at you. Okay, like yeah. this? That little screw on the side, you can, oh, okay. loosen, you can loosen this guy. I'll, I'll come on like this. Put it right at your chin. Okay. Like that. All right. We're in the south side of, we're south side of Chicago. South side? Yeah, with Ray Love as a, a, young, a young man. Go. Uh, not that, well, kind of young, but not that young. But, uh, <laughs> uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, I'm the youngest of six. I got five older sisters. Uh, you know, gr- gr- growing up in the shower, you know, saw a lot. Uh, grew up, went to grammar school, high school. Uh, went on ahead to college and tried to make some myself. You went to college in D.C.? Yes, sir. I went, you, you studied I, broadcasting, television production? Uh, yes. I, uh, well, well, to be honest with you, I went to a number of colleges. I uh, studied business administration at S- South Suburban College. Didn't like it. It was boring. I was wanting to be in business myself, but you don't have to have a degree in business yep. to go in business. Uh, boring as hell. Then I uh, went to uh, this junior college called Kennedy King College on the south side of Chicago. It's right. in Inglewood. And I studied broadcast and I really liked it. I was good at it. Took some radio classes, yeah. television. And I took a couple of film uh, other classes. And I really liked it and my grades ex- uh, really excelled. Yeah. So um, I uh, wanted to go to a big college. I was always hearing about Howard. You know, so many great uh, um, very influential uh, black people went there. So I is that, a, is that a black college? Yeah, uh, yes, predominantly black college. Right? No disrespect, but it was funny. It's named after a slave owner called Otis T. Howard, which huh. I found. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I said, how could this guy? And one was like, boy, shut up when I said it. <laughs> and I was really uh, working my comedy chops. Well, even, even in my youth. But anyway, back to college. I uh, decided to go there, got accepted at other schools, and I picked Howard. Okay. Because I thought they had a great curriculum. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's because you like journalism or broadcast. What was your, the the, okay. na- the title for me? It was uh, mass communication mm-hmm. um, with a focus in broadcast journalism. And there were three types of journalism you could, or three things in communication you could focus on. You could go print journalism, like newspaper magazine right. type. You could go broadcast journalism, which is television right. or radio, and then they had marketing. Right. <clears throat> Which is, I thought marketing was interesting because marketing is all about selling stuff. That's really yeah. seems like more of a business thing. But you know, but now I learned about like the news, and you see a lot of how the news is not really the news. The news right. is just the message of whoever is keeping the lights on at the news. Absolutely. And no one, not we, are not keeping the lights on at the news because we do not get our news from the news. Mm. I remember I was, yeah, so, well, my thing is supply demand, right? So supply and demand always equals. So if, yes. if, if, if we got people want this much coffee and we're, we're producing this much coffee. Yes. Now, if you take away the, uh, if you, if, if you, if you say coffee's illegal, right? Mm. Coffee wow. is the new, you know, coffee is the new, uh, whatever the drug is, you mm-hmm. know, coffee is the new fentanyl. It's totally legal. You can't have it. Wow. You know, they just put in that category. Wow. And now you have a demand for it, but the supply is illegal. So you have some criminals. They they weren't criminals before. <laughs> right. But now they're criminals getting yeah. you the coffee because what right. else? That's what they do. They do coffee. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And there's a supply. So supply and demand always equal, right? Right. So if you make the supply illegal, the demand will still be there yes. and it will be met by a black market and that's how you create a black market. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, the with the news, 
we don't there's no demand for the news mm. when i was at a tv station nbc 13 in birmingham that's where i oh, interned. Okay. i did two semesters there that place was not a tiny station you know mm. they they were like market i don't know you're in markets like how they had the different so this one was like market like 15 or 25 or so but out of like you know 300 or something like that like they were up there it wasn't like it's Birmingham, you know what mm. I mean? It wasn't New York, but it also wasn't like Hattiesburg where I'm from. You oh, know? okay. It was just Birmingham. It's a big city. So they had... South, huh? So it was a pretty big market, and their station was just... It was kind of like... It needed to be renovated, you know? They, their their editing stuff was that old cassette tape stuff. What was what, that called? Like Betamax? Is that what, it was... What, what, it was what, like what, the what, yeah, knobs. VHS, VHS. I, I, I'm in the VTR. That's what it was. Yeah, it's yeah, the, yeah, small, yeah. v, the small uh, VHS ones, right? Yeah, yeah. And they put those in the big cameras. What, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That big Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, yeah. the April O'Neil cameras. Yeah, those big old cameras yeah. back in the day. I remember seeing those. Yeah, uh, actually, April always had like a little like gun camera that I yeah. never understood. She had like a little camcorder. Oh, yeah. I had one of them camcorders. She, she never had a gun. They gave her like a stick she could fight wow. the shredder with, but they always yeah. had to have give her a camera because she was a reporter. But, uh, the station was falling apart. It basically, hmm. like, that was starting to shift. That's when the internet was, like, 2005, 2006, right. when the internet was beginning to become what it is now. Yes. And I always say, like, if we get a big old mushroom crowd come up from, you know, Area 51 or something, wow. you know, like, we're going to go, well, that might be not be a good example. If we see a big, you know, we look at, if we look over here, we go into, like, I don't know. We we get to the point where we, you can see like the whole strip because we're like in the in the southeast. We're not really in, and you see like half of the strip is on fire. Right. I'm not waiting till the news comes on to see what happens. Yeah, no. You know, you hear about something. When I was in Malaysia, mm-hmm. that's when the Vegas shooting happened. But, wow. And I'm in Malaysia. I'm like 2013. Oh. Yeah. That was yeah. Nine years ago. Wow. And so I just went. I'm not looking at the news. I'm I went to Facebook. And I found out, I, and I found out all the information, and then some of the information that they covered up later, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that was that was where I realized, like, oh, the news is not really. Well, I knew that back when I was doing reporting, but mm-hmm. uh, so there's not a demand yet. We got more news. We got more mainstream mm-hmm. news than ever. So we got more supply and no demand. And in economics, that means the government has stepped in mm-hmm. and bought that. They bought that market. Absolutely. That's like big banks. That's like uh, the corn industry is another example I bring up, where like they had all this, inf- all this farms and all this stuff to make all this corn, but they don't need all that. People just don't want to eat that much corn. Mm. But they were producing all this corn, so that's when they started like making corn syrup and all these other corn products and working mm. them into the food, using the FDA to get that in. So and the government came in and subsidized it. So mm. we have farms that. Like if you like if you and me start a farm, what what we Ray, what do we what do we sell on our farm? Mm-hmm. What do we produce? Ray and well, Dave and Ray we got a farm. E I E I O. What do we <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully we can produce some good vegetables, things of that nature, that way we won't have to be worried about all that GMO crazy things. You know? What kind of vegetables would we do? Mm, uh, I, I would do like beets, like Dwight Schrute. Oh well, you like know, beets, beets are very good. I, I I try to incorporate that into my smoothie for cause they're good for the blood. Yeah, uh, I would say collard greens is what I eat. Which is funny, you know, my mother used to cook them, but you know, I eat them raw. Then why you take that? Because they got they have a lot of good vitamins in them. Uh, kale. Yeah. Kale has a I eat a ton of kale. Oh, do you put God. it in a smoothie or you just eat it raw? I eat it raw. You wow. know, I'm, I'm I'm like I'm like old dirty bass. Ooh, baby, I like it raw. I like to eat it raw. <laughs> no, but sometimes I do put it in a smoothie too. If ODB was ever on Sesame Street, that's what it would be. He'd do that song, but he'd be eating vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy. ODB on I just on saw Sesame that thing on him on Wu-Tang, man. That's oh, one of my favorite hip-hop group. And when I was in college, boy, we used to boom that. And what's funny, I, I, my degree is I studied TV production of, 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 of a community. Right, that's what I was getting yeah. to. So we studied the same. I went off on mm-hmm. a whole freaking thing, but... We both studied journalism. Mine yes. was broadcast journalism, focused on communication. I got lost in advertising. What was yours? What was the title? Mine was TV production or television TV production. production. Yeah, that's what I studied. And also I studied some, I had a, uh, uh, took some acting class, interacting on majors. 
Um, I uh, had a film class uh, of and it was with this guy, Professor Rocky Jump. Oh, I loved it. It was fun teaching us about lighting and all that thing. And then I uh, a film class like making movies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like and, camera work, and, right? And, and and a lot of my uh, friends I was cool <clears throat> tight with at Howard. Uh, they they had film class and they were shooting small independent films. I would you know help them out. Yeah. Uh, and of course, like they wanted an actor. That's how I got into this one. My first independent film was To Be Enslaved. This is oh man, this girl. She I auditioned for it. She thought I was funny, and then I, I did. She loved me, you know. And then she booked me. I played. Yeah. This, I played. I played the son on that name, Duante. I still remember that movie. This was almost thirty years ago. You got a copy of it? No, I, I never did get a chance to see it. It's gonna but, be on. It's gonna be on that like VT, I don't know. VTC. But, but what's funny? I um I did a film, uh, earlier this year called uh Run Nixon. Uh, the guy from B2K, uh, Lil Fizz is in it. And the, the director that saw me last week, and he, he told me about that. And he also told me that with some other good news, which made me, he said he, uh, he, he wanted me to read for this one part. And uh, I'm going to shoot for And uh, he said he, believe he, he he wants to fly me out there to, out to Georgia to shoot. So I said, to ATL? I said, Shh, I'm down. <clears throat> Let me know. Cool. I did two movies here. Yeah, what'd you do here? Uh, I, did, I did a movie by the name of, of uh, called One Time. I put it up on Facebook. Yeah. Because uh, one of my roommate, one of my ex roommates said, like, "Man, I look uh, Big Doc, comedian Big Doc from LA City. He said, "I look up, I see this food Ray Love in this movie One Time. I'm cracking, I'm laughing." Did because because a week before that, my, uh, my one of my ex, my roommates who I stayed with said, "Well, man, why you tell me you're in this movie?" And and because he texted me, I said, "Oh, because he because he he showed me the the, the clip and." Uh, uh, the, the the cover of it, I said, yeah, man, I did. I thought I showed you. He said, I forgot using this movie, and I just posted on Facebook to go to Dubai. Another movie I'm in is gonna be called uh, COVID 2023 uh, that we shot uh, earlier uh, last year. Oh, is that one of those? What is it? Okay, I play a zombie in the movie. Because <laughs> COVID 2023 yeah. is of course a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, that, that, it don't give you a cough. It gives mm. you the I gotta eat some brains or whatever. Yeah. Are they fast zombies or slow zombies? Uh, I was like a fast zombie. I was biting to this guy. It was crazy. I had a Kevin Pierce in that. So um, cool. So you get to be a, a zombie. Yeah. In a, <laughs> a zombie. Don't you think it's weird they would inspire? They would. They would actually make a horror movie inspired by stuff that's currently going on. Yeah. That's, that's like amazing. making a World War II movie during the Holocaust. <laughs> exactly. Like, it seems a little. It's like. You, people say like too soon and that's like a joke but yeah, like, that's, that's too just soon. too soon dude yeah it was fun doing unless it, they want to cast my friend Ray Love I'll let you, <laughs> man I, I, I watch a movie I watch a, uh, I watch Brad Pitt fight all of the <laughs> Ray Love zombies <laughs> he's I would love to work with Brad because Brad is he's up to he been, he's a veteran veteran actor and right before they bite you they laugh like <laughs> that they, I got you now <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> That'd be hilarious. Give me that foot. If I work with Brad Pitt, man, I man, I'd be soaking up all that acting game. That'd be so cool. Cause yeah. you really like acting, huh? You've done acting's been my first love since I was five. I knew I wanted to do that since I was a kid. Okay, and then in college, you didn't really, you weren't really feeling theater. Cause let's be honest, especially oh, no, 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 no. I, did um, you do I, I did a play at, uh, called Rumble Steel Skin when I was nineteen, when I was in college, but but I was at South Suburban. And I, I did a, another play called The Night of January 16th. Man, it's me. I remember all this. I was in my my mid-20s. Uh, I did that at this uh, Chicago local theater. They loved me. My mother came and saw it. I thought it was good. Um, did some other... I did a lot of background work in Chicago. I was on prison break. My best friend's wedding. Um, Do you have Stir of I, Echoes. Yeah, I have an IMDb. I yeah. didn't know I had one because, like... I also I did an independent film called Why Man Cheat with this guy named Mark Harris who shot a lot of other good movies that um that 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 been on BET. Uh, him and this guy um, also was in uh, another called Holla If You Hear Me, and <laughs> for me at Why Man Cheat, people were like, "Oh, look great!" It was fun. Yeah, I didn't know you done so much acting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Be- because um, and also the guy that played remember the old school show. Uh, Starskin Hutch. Yeah. Well, it's a guy. He he, he played Huggy Bear. His name is Antonio Fargas. That's being an actor. He produced two plays I was in here called Two Trains Running. He like me and he's, he's like, stop. He was giving me direction. I'm like, 
That's what he said. Well, what's your problem? I said, nothing. I'm listening to you because you're a legend. He like, you know my work? I said, come on, dude. Yeah. I said, of course I know your work. I said, dude, come on. You play um, Huggy Bear. I said, you was in Car Wash. He was like, oh. I said, I said, yeah, you was on Martin. I said, come on, man. Yeah. Cool guy. You know, he was tough on me, but I'm like, I wanted that because I like when people can bring out the best in me. You know? Yeah. And, and and that that really challenged me. That was cool being there and that play. And I I knew that was my first love as a kid. Yeah. You know, just my parents, they knew. And comedy was something that was just natural, just making people laugh, being, writing silly stories, coming up with stuff, saying sarcastic stuff, getting beat for it. And my comedy idol, of course, is Eddie Murphy. I remember once I was about 12, uh, I'm a... Uh, 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 my nephews, they paid me eat, paid me five dollars each. So I got paid ten dollars to do Eddie Murphy for dinner. So <laughs> I did it, and my parent, com- we was over with my parents. They had company. They was dying. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm like, hey, pass me the beat and stuff like that. So I'm gonna be gay back. I'm like, get that guy out of here. And they was dying. I I stayed in character. They was like, look at this little dude. They was rolling. Oh man, my parents looking at me like, like, I think we got Eddie Murphy there. I said, I said get the heck out of here. <laughs> and they was just rolling. I was just staying in character. It was just big shots. I was, I was studying Eddie, you know, just watching him on TV, on Saturday Night Live, just his mannerisms. I, I was tag, you know, and all that, doing all yeah. that. And I stayed in character. And it was like, yeah, he. They said he's a good actor. They said he's gonna act like he did in a minute. And I'm like, <laughs> How old were you? I, I was like twelve. <laughs> I didn't break character, but but my, my nephews was dying. They they ran outside laughing. I just said they answered. I said, "Wait, well, this ain't Ray Long. This is Eddie. Eddie cool when you call me Ray. That's good. This is what it's done for." <laughs> and they were just like, "Oh, this, they were the man. The company was in tears. I just had them going, and that felt good. I'm like, wow, I like this. Yeah." Yeah. Wow, that's Eddie Murphy's got such a distinct style. I mean, he's really, oh, one of my favorite. Yes, he's such a unique. I mean, he, he's he's just a unique talent. He's got yes. his own way. There, there's nobody. He doesn't really strike me as the type of guy that, uh, like, like it, it. I guess you can see elements from like previous people. See elements of like Richard Pryor, or whoever. Like, oh, absolutely. But yeah, I heard a story. It's funny that that's that's how. You kind of realized you were because you were always making your friends laugh. That was like sort of your first performance, right? Where they like they paid mm-hmm. you got paid to do an Eddie Murphy impression right. at family dinner, right? Yeah. And acting because my father was a postman, and okay. I was, since, since his outfit looked like a bus driver's outfit, as a kid, my favorite shows were of course were um uh were, were Sanford and Son, you know. The honey Red Fox. And Red, c- I used to watch that all uh, the time. And I would do, what do you mean I go to go to bed? Oh, you're right, ma. But what, take my outfit because I would put it on like I'm Ralph Cranberry. And if I laugh, like this went crazy. It just, I, I would just watch those episodes. I, it's like I was being birthed into comedy as a little five year old, six year old kid. I'm watching, I'm seeing how they set up there, like, okay. And they like, and I'm, but what's funny, I'm watching it, but I'm not watching. I'm watching the thing. I'm like, I'm seeing how they set it up. And I'm, I'm watching. I'm like, okay, that's how they, they set it up in threes. Like, they went threes company. I see they set up the joke. And I was writing a little, little crazy stuff, but I was doing voice to Flintstones and putting James <coughs> Brown. And man, the crowd, they were like, could Ray read his story? It'd be so boring. They won't, they won't hear Ray, Ray do a story. Yeah. And, and, I, and I get up there and everybody dying laughing. I, I'm, I'm having. Kids from older kids watching me. It's like that. That was just exciting for me. I, 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 I just yeah. got an idea, dude. What's um, that? I I have, I, you know, this apartment is like half apartment mm-hmm. and then half preschool. Yeah. Because I got my three year old. Yeah. I got some children's books. Would you would you read uh, one of these children's books? Is man, zero, I to, man, that would be so. But that's what you started doing. But you would imitate you. It was it all. This is my theory: is that at the core of all comedy, mm-hmm. stand up comedy, at the, at the very core, when you get to where what it is to make fun of something, 
Mm-hmm. What what do you do when your mom says something? You say, well, my mom said that. that, that mm-hmm. and my mom was like, you better. Blah, blah, blah. It's like that's you making fun of her, mm-hmm. you know, uh, telling a story about her, you know, getting mad at you about what whatever it was, you know. But it's always about you tease someone, you know. Mm-hmm. You got the, your your buddy says something funny, mm-hmm. or he says something in a weird way, or doesn't hit right, so you make yeah. fun of him. You say, yeah. right? And <clears throat> Eddie Murphy. You were talking about the bus, and you were talking about performing uh, when you were young, making fun of or, or imitating. Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear the story about how Eddie Murphy knew he was going to be a comedian? Yes, because see, what's funny, who, who people don't know, his real name is Edward Regan Murphy, and he was born April 3rd, 1961. I know you're like, damn, no, because see, one thing I found out, to be good, you got to study some of the greats. So I, I, I read his book, Life and Times of a Comic on the Edge, oh, okay. by Frank Sanatello. I read it, talked about how he stayed in Foster Homes, how he would imitate Elvis Presley down in his basement. And he has a brother, uh, his, his stepfather name was Vernon, uh, I think I think Vernon, Ma- Ver- 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 Vernon Sorrell, Vernon Maxwell, something like that. And I know he has a half-brother that was in a hip-hop group called K-9 Posse in the late 80s. And instead of whooping them, disciplining them, he would he would make them he would put on gloves and box them. That's why people don't understand that Eddie Murphy studied boxing because in forty eight hours when he fought Nick Nolte, he was good when he was in in, in, in neutral stands. Then he went to southpaw. I I was like, wow, I was noticing that. Yeah. And I know he he would do stuff like that. And when I was reading the book, I said, well, his story is like mine. And the day he gave birth to comedy, guess what? It was on my mother's birthday, huh. July the 9th. At 76 when he started. So I was like, wow, he started comedy on my mother's birthday. How did you know that exact date? Was that something Eddie Murphy said in his book? Yes, he okay. said, he, it, well, that's what he said in the book. And he talked about him. And uh, and plus, I, I, um, I, I watched this interview, too, that he did with Rip Torn on uh, Inside the Actor Studio. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when he's talking about don't take another comic's advice. Rip Torn, it wasn't uh, James mm-hmm. Lipton? Yeah, 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 I'm sorry, James Lipton, yes. Okay. The older gentleman with the, like, yeah. With the, Will yes, Ferrell used Martin to do it. You yeah. cast him, yeah. Will Ferrell did a great yes. impression of him. You remember yeah. that from SNL? Oh, look, I, and, and that's why I would watch Eddie Murphy. Even the, even the one with uh, Chevy Chase and John Belushi, Dana. The original, oh, I mean, when he gosh. was the original cast of SNL when yes. it's like it, it, SNL then was like yes. MTV in like yes. 88 they didn't know what the fuck uh-huh. they were doing right. they were just trying stuff they're like I don't know we'll see you know it's funny do you know I found out that Byron <clears throat> Allen had auditioned for it but Eddie Murphy didn't, didn't make it but then they came back and had him do a read again and he made it and he was on there and he, he, he had the richest selling he but was like 18 years old right he, he, he was 19 wow 18 or 19, but, but then he said by 21 he wanted to be a millionaire. Then he did. Then um, he, uh, he, he was on. Uh, two of them, they, they thought his act was too quote unquote blue because I heard him say on. Uh, Eddie Murphy's on, blue as fuck though. Right, right you know. <laughs> and that, that's why I know how I'm like that. So he, he said that he was doing a show um, at, at some spot. And he, he said, guess who walked in? Rodney Dangerfield, another one of my favorites. Oh, no, you're fa- man, I always yeah. love Rodney. It was hilarious. He's a goat. Oh, he is hilarious. And so he he, he asked him, would you watch my, would you, would you watch his set? He said, yeah. Eddie Murphy did, ripped it. He said, came off stage, Rodney Dangerfield kind of crushed his. He said, man, you curse too much. You ain't going to make it. You're too blue. Yeah. And then he was like, damn. So he stuck to his guns. He said, about a year and a half later, he was headlining at, at the Fairmont, something like that, and he said, "Right, Dangerfield walked in. Oh my God, who knew?" Yeah, that's why I say stick these guns. But that was years ago. That's different from now with yeah, this that was cancel like culture. Eighties, right? It's 70s, more like the maybe. late seventies, early eighties. Because wow. when I saw Delirious, I was when I saw when I saw uh, that um, Forty Eight Hours, I thought he was just hilarious. The movie was so good. Oh. <laughs> That movie was 20 both, years both old. Of both of 48 hours. <laughs> yeah. Right. The verse was the bomb. Then Trading Places and, you know, The Golden Child. I just, I was just that laughing. And, and I'm in grit and I'm in high school. And, you know, when the teacher says something, I'm laughing like Eddie Ray. Everybody look, look at me. I go, <laughs> and, they, and everybody dying because they know I'm going to get in trouble Ooh, for acting up. So you, you have a pretty extensive background in acting 
I mean, that's yes, you, you like Thank like you. comedic acting or like drama, or is it just you just like being on stage? Well, I love it both because you love karaoke too. Oh, like, you know uh, what I mean? Like you like you God. like you like an audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, put it like this: I like any form of entertainment when I can get feedback because to me, it's like live is the best. Like, of course, I love I love my stand up. Yeah. I love expressing myself because you're a character up there on stage. It's all you. But at the same time, I do love theater. Because you get a, a reaction from the live order, you got to live, you got to project. Because I, right. um, I was in a play uh, like 10, 12 years ago called Preacher's Kid, The Untold Stories. Okay. And my aunt and my mom. Hey, you done a lot of plays, yeah, huh? I, I, it was so fun, man. Play, plays are the bomb. I yeah. love it. You know, I've done a lot, like I said, I've done a lot of extra work. Like I said, I was in uh, Prison Break. Uh, my best friend's ready. And he, um, I had some Cupid back in the day, uh, early edition with Kyle Chandler, uh, of the, uh, Drew Barrymore, a movie she did called uh, Never Been Kissed. I was in that. I saw her. She was very smart. I spoke both Kevin Bacon, Stir of Echoes, number of stuff. You know. Cool. Yeah. You done actual like Hollywood stuff? Yeah, I, nice. but not speaking role like, hey, come in. No, I was background, done a lot of work like that. But you done a lot of extra work. I mean, the thing is, if you do enough extra work, I mean, you yes. that's just it's just like being getting into a comedy club or something. You just show up. You got to be there. Yeah. Eventually, you meet enough people. You network. You don't ever. You never know yeah. how you're gonna network. Exactly. But if you if you're in the network and like yes. this geography, it'll yes. happen. If you if, right. if you're paying attention, you'll get better. Yeah. Or you'll upgrade or whatever. Because. That's cool. I was cool with the cast. Of Prince. I would talk with Wentworth Miller. I would talk with uh, the guy, um, uh, uh, the one, the guy. That, he 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 played on Constantine, and he also was a bad voice too. Uh, Peter, that was his name. Okay. Very, very good actor. Cat tall, old guy. Good because he started as an extra. You know, Robert De Niro started as an extra. Okay. Who is the goat? He is my favorite actor of all time. Uh. Oh, when I saw Taxi Driver as a little baby boy, man, I said, this ain't got to be the bad one. Smart Scorsese, oh, I love his work. Him and Kate Fitt, and everybody keep teasing me. Uh, when I was a kid, they said that when he was in that, that role of Kate Fitt, he was so funny. And when he was blowing that, that cigar uh, in, in that movie theater, everybody said, that's you right there. I said, no way. And, and like, everybody would, t- when he played Max Cady, and what's funny, I was watching, I watched the older movie, Gregory Peck. Okay. Good movie. And people was like, why are you watching those movies? I said, I'm studying. I'm like, what did you? But then I know I'm studying now how, yeah. how, how it's different. You're looking at, ten, like my sister went to film school. Mm. And she said that after her, she got her degree, she could never enjoy a movie the same way. Because right. Because she's looking at everything but the movie. Technically, you know? right. She's looking at, yeah, she's looking at the lighting. The writing, the editing. Yes. She's like, "Oh, this is this is. They use this filter instead of that filter, or whatever. Look at how they make everything seem kind of blue, and then that goes along with the whatever. Yes, like she's only looking at. She just mm-hmm. it's like when the Matrix, they just see the green yes. writing instead of people. That's like my sister when she watches yes. the movie. <clears throat> but yeah, that's like you've always been kind of like that, where you're painting, yeah. you're taking notes. Yes, they say Ben like Stiller that. was like that. Jerry Stiller was saying that when yes. his. When Ben would be watching TV as a kid, he realized this guy's learning blocking, he's learning lighting, yes. he's learning to write. Like, he's actually paying attention to a lot of elements besides, like, oh, that was a fun story, or that guy's, you know. From Zoolander. You know, both his parents were, uh, were I think, the comedy. Ben, yeah. Ben, ben, uh, Jerry Stiller. J- Jerry Stiller and, what's the name? Yeah. I don't Andy know. Stiller. I forget, I forget his, the wife's name. Yeah, yeah, but the Stiller, they're like, yeah, they're like comedy. They're yeah. like, go back to vaudeville, right? Yes. Like, they yes. go back to the old. Old timey, they get you with a hook. They got a piano right. player. The guys with the hats from Family Guy. Right, exactly. <laughs> All those dudes. Right. That's yeah. just like the Batemans. I know Justine Bateman and uh, Jason Bateman. They brother and sister. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I know uh, rest in peace, Kirk Douglas. That's Michael Douglas's father. Right. And I know Tony Curtis was an actor back in the day, and Jamie Lee Curtis from Halloween. That's her father. Man, Jamie Lee Curtis was in all my science books when I was a kid. Really? She was a hermaphrodite. Uh, really? That was in science class. There were two celebrities that came up in science class. Jamie Lee Curtis, because they were talking about uh, uh, like having male and female sex organs. And mm. I don't know why that was in our textbooks. But 
And I don't know if that's just like some prank that science teachers play on kids or if it's real or what. It might be one of the maybe she tried to get out of Scientology and they're like, all right, well, we're going to we're going to put you in all the textbooks as a hermaphrodite or whatever. But um, but yeah, there was that. And the other one was Denzel Washington, uh, not for being a hermaphrodite, but because he was like uh, scientifically beautiful. Because if you take a picture and mm-hmm. you draw a line down the middle of his face, then you mirror this one and put the right side and the double, double the right side, double the left side. You know, everyone's a little bit different. Yeah. And people who are, but Denzel's, he, his face is the same on both sides. He's got good symmetry is what they call it, right? So they say that equals, that's actually beauty. So like when they had like these, this they had the test holiday, this is kind of a stretch, but the test holiday was like this, this big fat uh, woman from England the giant plus size model. She was on the cover of Cosmopolitan, and back in the beginning, a lot of this woke stuff, it uh, it was big. You know, one of the, it's like one of these. It, it, all of the fat person stuff is just pretty much Lizzo now. Like, <laughs> right. like she. They, it's like they boiled it down. It's like they're like, right. we don't need to talk about anyone but Lizzo because she's the most recognizable name and she's the loudest voice in that and she's whatever. But Tess Holiday was like a. Um, well, she was a plus size model. She yeah. made the cover of Cosmo, and it was weird, right? I know you're talking. And people about. Are like, oh, it's a she doesn't belong on there. It's a beauty magazine, and I was like, no, 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 you got to break it down. Beauty is about symmetry. She's right. a model. She's right. got good symmetry. She's a beautiful person. She's not gonna outrun me if we're getting chased by a bear, <laughs> right. you know. <laughs> but it doesn't mean she, it doesn't mean she's not beautiful. <laughs> right. It's a different people. Mm. Are, they don't distinguish stuff. Right. It's like when when uh, it's like Black Lives Matter, uh, which is right. like, there's a touch of one, but then there's like the actual. There's the message, which right. is like yeah. Okay. And right. then there's the the actual functional organization right. which had a little sketchiness around mm-hmm. it, right and mm-hmm. that woman she's like I'm a communist and I just bought my third 10 million dollar house or whatever wow right and okay. or Marxist actually specifically is what she said okay. it, was, it was it was pretty wild but and then, then they had they had man, I don't I don't want to go too like right. Tresmala on all this right now <laughs> but yeah but it's like you got to distinguish right because just because she's fat it doesn't mean she's not beautiful right you know but there are reasons that people, so not everybody, but some people are not attracted to people who are, you know, extra heavy. But that, yeah, that yeah exactly. But you that know. doesn't mean beauty is a, you right. know, attraction is a perspective. Like, a, a, yes, know, it is. I know. might look at a girl and be like, that girl's beautiful. You look at that girl and be like, oh, that yeah, is exactly. not interesting right. to me. And it doesn't matter. But you can scientifically argue that Denzel Washington has good symmetry because you can oh, do yeah. the experiment. You know what I mean? And that's how... They, have you ever seen that, though? In psychology books, they do that, where you can... You you, you mirror up your face. I love the way he, he points his finger. Count. count. What? The way, the way he do his finger. Denzel. Oh, Denzel. Dude, talk about an talk, actor. Talk, man. Yeah, I, I, another I, one of my famous, Samuel Jackson. I should have known I was going to trigger your actor, your Ooh, actor fan man. with Denzel Washington. He's so good. I haven't seen a good Denzel... I haven't seen a Denzel Washington movie in a while, but the, every single one of them I've seen... Has he's one of the rare guys where where he can he's a he's a top he's as good as they get as an actor, but it's not like um what's an example like Bruce Willis. Oh, right. man. Bruce Willis is a great actor, but in every movie he's kind of Bruce Willis. Right. Well, that's just like with Denzel, and you know somebody else who to me he was an underrated actor who who is so versatile. Well, hold on, I was gonna I, say with Denzel, it's like when he yeah. he actually. For me, he seemed like such a character where he yeah. he was so good at acting, he could actually... You would forget that you're watching right. Denzel Washington, and you get lost in the character that he's playing. Right. Like, the guy... Although he got really good at that that dude who's kind of, like, fucked up on his last leg, but, like, he's had a dark history, yeah. and he's trying to do the right thing, but he kind of doesn't care anymore. Like, in, uh, like in Flight... You remember Flight, where he was that pilot? Yeah, yeah. yeah and then yeah. what was the one where he, uh, the girl got kidnapped? Man on Fire. Oh, Man on Fire. Oh, yeah, Dude. man. But like, uh, and and, cause, and then you see, you, did you ever see the one Fallen? That's when I was first really aware. Oh, yeah, with the voice of, oh, yeah, with the voice. Of, right, that was the first one because he had to kind of go into different characters during that. But I don't know, maybe you got a different take on it because he really he does have a lot of very specific mannerisms. Yes. Yes. That he does, that are sort of his 
thing. Huh. Like De Niro does that thing where he smiles and frowns mm-hmm. at the same time. He's like, where? He does, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, like he's got what Denzel what a training day. Dude, like, training day was so good. <laughs> my brother. Yeah. He's like, huh? He's like, I'm trying to read my paper now. Please shut up. I didn't know you like to get wet, rookie. Okay. He says, like, ain't nobody black, nobody put a gun in your head. He said, huh? You want to be a sheep? Got to be a real. <laughs> man, he just nailed, man. So Though he great. played an asshole, but he was a hell of a cop in, in that movie. And, I, of course, I loved him and Malcolm X. Everything he did, this gold. He's like a. It it's good. weird you have like a leading man who's yeah. so masterful at the anti hero. Yes. He's like an anti hero, sort of. Mm-hmm. Training Day, he was like the bad guy, yes. but you didn't know he was the bad guy until like the second half of the movie. And then you realize, like, oh, this guy's not just street smart. He might be a little too mm-hmm. street smart, you know? He's like, what's wrong with street justice? Right. And I, I loved him in Antoine Fish, another one of my favorite movies, with Derek Luke, great yeah. actor. Um, also, a, a, one of my favorite actors called Ving Rhymes. Oh, yeah. Ving Rhymes. He's been, a, he's one of those guys oh. who, Woo! Like, I feel like Tarantino might do a movie starring him as somebody. He's like yeah. that type of thing where yes. he's never like main, main, mainstream, but like, you know, like, like you talk about like your, your Denzel Washington level yes. actor. Like oh, he was never God. quite there, but he's everywhere else. Uh, another good one is Jeffrey Wright. Oh, my God. Who's he? Peace. Okay, Jeffrey Wright. He played Peoples in uh in, in, in Shaft that came out two thousand. The new he, Shaft. Uh, uh, or the more recent one. Yeah, what, what that came out twenty something. He 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 he, he played Puerto. I didn't, I thought he was Puerto Rican, but really he was so good. Yeah. Uh, he also played in um uh, other movies. Uh, of course, uh, my man who I met here at the MGM, Don Cheadle. Oh, Don oh Cheadle's my so cool. God. Man, it, it, uh, another one, Brooklyn's Finest. Him and my other guy, Wesley Snipes. Yeah, Wesley I, Snipes. Uh, an, another uh, uh, good movie that 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 uh, Don Chi was in is called Talk to Me. Him with 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 Chai Wattel I believe that's how the correct pronunciation. I don't know. Yeah, he he he's from England. Uh-huh. Great actor. Oh my God, awesome role. What do you think it takes to to be a good actor? Because I realize that there's a lot of... That's a good question, David. I'm going to try to answer it the best of my capability. Everybody has their own opinion, but I'm just going to give the Ray Love taste on it. Right. Right. I would say to be a great actor, to me, it has to be believable. That's the number thing. Just like like me. People know me as Ray Love. I'm a silly, goofy guy. But it's like, when I get in the character, I'm getting in the character. And I go, I'm doing, I'm the actor Ray Love, Ray Coop. Um, but I'm coming as I'm gonna try to come as that character, and I, I quite can break out the character. But my thing is, I want to get a synopsis of who this who, who this character is, and I'm gonna play it to my best capability. Cause like in this play movie called Run Nixon, I won't write. I played the character. I was I was a basketball coach, and they was like, wow. So when when they, when they was gone. I'm up here talking to the girl like I and, I, and I'm saying something like this. This, this no good as guy, and they was like. Brian, what's up with Ray? He, he stayed in character all till you came back, and they was dying. Yeah. And I was out with myself. I act like I'm talking to my wife. I was trying to get get more in the character as, as being the basketball coach. Okay. And they, they was like, "Wow, that was good." I said, "So what? You think so?" And you know, I, and they, was, they was like, "Yeah, for real." And so they was like, "Wow, you should just do this full time." Like I said, "Well, I would love to if I could get paid for it." You know, because it's like I know that's what my true passion is, man. Yeah, you I, clearly I love knew. acting. Oh yes, that and comedy. It's <clears throat> so is the why Ray Love? Why is that the stage name? That's the stage name you called okay, it or was that name you had for okay. way long? Well, okay, well, well it's I <laughs> I was in college, of course of course, I went to college of course. Yeah. And these guys Ray Love was a rapper. And no, I, I'm not buying it. Cause see he spelled his L U R A Y L U V and I spelled my R A Y L O V E. So when I was in college, these guys said, What's up, Ray Love? I'm like Call me Ray Love for so it's like I took it and I embraced it. Did you so, look like him or something? No, I, I just they just started calling me Ray Love. They started calling you that. Yeah, so I so I figured I started and I've always been a guy that very analytical. So I said my name's an acronym. Ray R A Y stands for real and always yearning. Love stands for live, original, very entertaining. That describes who I am. Yeah, I just put that together. I, that that's just who I am. I just took rolled with that name ever since. 
when you do stand-up comedy, when did you get into that? Okay, I got into stand-up, like I said, for years, uh, it started like this. For years, people always telling me, well, you funny, you should be, you missed your car, you should take that acting on the road, you know, you should get into comedy. So people always telling me that I'm on acting sets, feel like, you funny, you hilarious. So I had a cast laughing, all the class clown, clown acting up, yada, yada, yada. So I'm at this gym where I work out at called Valley in the suburb of Chicago. A guy by the name of Richard Wynn, who name is Whistle. He's coming, he's looking on like, man, what's up, man? What you, 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 you have me? So he's like, no, you funny. He like, you got a gift. I'm like, well, where is it at? And everybody laughing. You know, so he's telling me I was funny, and he see me doing his impressions and all this. And, you know, a lady, lady says something smart. I'm sick and sick of family talking about how bad everybody dying. And he like, man, you waste your talent. So then, here it is in October of 2002. It was a comedy club called Riddles, and it's, and it's, it's in uh, Chicago, a suburb of Chicago, on my Ken Stevens. I go up there one night. I'm the tenth comedian. I do well. So the rest is history. Bomb, rock, rock, bomb, bomb, bomb. Then went to my phase. I got booed before, and the rest is history. I am. How'd you end up in Las Vegas? Ended up in Las Vegas. Uh, my father, you know, rich from Chicago. He, he he was out here since uh, 2004. And my father drove out here, so. Uh, he, uh, I, I, I was, was, was one, one to, in 2011, I said, I don't want to be in Chicago, it's too damn cold, because the snow was up to my chest down there. Um, so, my dad came to visit in Chicago, so I was like, man, he was just like, uh, I, I, he got me a plane ticket, and I came up here, and he was just like, to me, it's like, you playing, like, yeah, you coming, you got a room, I'm like, this dude on is he trying to trick me to come here so i'm like man i do like the weather out here i said man man, it's beautiful i said i could bring my window clean up long story short we drove all the way back out to chicago i packed all my stuff in that car and drove back out here to vegas and i am that was august of 2011. all right and now you and your your business that you you're running now is a you do window cleaning you're yes my, that yes now? ray love window cleaning service and my motto is this if you want your window to shine call us anytime Entrepreneurship is something that's all been in my blood. I, I had a video recording company. This is my, uh, called Ray Love, video recording company. My motto was this, for the right loot, we will shoot. This is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I sold, I sold uh, hygiene products. I used to tell them, you want to be clean, give me a call. You know what I mean? I had a little catchy saying. Yeah. And I had people laugh. And I was, you know, selling it to a uh, client. They were like, ooh, what's up with that body? And they call me and I come by there and, and uh, it's like I've been I've been hustling all my life, you know. You know, I've had my, my shit nine to five. This has never been my thing having a boss. I just always like to be my own boss. Yeah. I, I drive I drive Lyft and that's okay. still <clears throat> yeah. you, I make uh, you make as much in an eight hour shift or more than you would in a reg if you're working like right. a store or whatever. Uh, a lot of different restaurants. I make more than I did in like oh nine when I worked at a nightclub as a bar back. Okay. But I don't have to look away or right. be away. I just I turn on my app. I get to cut it up with strangers. I get to get all the gossip from wherever they're from. <laughs> right. And then I and then I go do open mics. Right. So I'm like working my material on the people in the back trying to crowd work right. it in. So I'm great with crowd work as long as I'm not facing the audience. Right. <laughs> That's where my But uh but you seem like you you ever you worked in sales before? Uh, yes, I have. I sold cars. Sell? All right. It was funny. I was at this place called Dave Miller Oldsmobile, and there, and I uh, it was funny. I, I got a crazy comedy story. That I said I've been working on how I, uh, I had to fight my boss because uh, he, he was pushing me. My thing. I had a hot temper in my youth, and I spit in his face, kicked him, and pushing. And it was. I thought we, we it was on. So. I left, I said, I, I can't work for nobody no more. And I, that's when I started Ray Love Window Clean Service. Yeah. Found a high dude made over 100 grand cleaning windows. I got the name of Philip Gregstone, Dr. Glass. So I, I, I just started as, as a young man in Chicago, going place to place, business to business. Had this bucket, skinny kid with, with a squeegee. Hey, would you like your windows clean? And I got me some cards. I had, I had my name on my card. I had me a uniform, hat, stuff like that. Uh, and 01, 02, that's when I was at the height of, of my business in Chicago. But I got lazy and complacent. It happens. Yeah. Well, nobody, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's uh, that's pretty cool. Though. So you, you, you have, it's interesting because you studied 
uh, uh, communications basically yes. in in school. Yes. And one of the aspects of communication is like print. Like, I don't know, yeah. we did this when it was on, but but advertising is part of it. You got yeah. a knack for that. Like, that's what advertising is. Advertising is yeah. kind of comedy, like, it's sales. Yeah. Like, you want to make, you want, I always think that <clears throat> comedy is a high level of public speaking, probably yeah. the highest, because you think about what is the point of public speaking. You could be a politician or a teacher or an oh, actor yeah. or whatever, but you got to get on a stage of some sort and communicate with multiple people, right? And, I got to get the idea in my head into your head. Yes. But the people who do that the best, think about a teacher that made you laugh. Yes. You always learn the most in that class. Oh, yeah, because, see, I hate being, listen to these boring presentations. Like, I'd be at the, when I was at the Kingdom Hall, oh, it'd be so damn boring. And, and, what's, and when we'd be at this place called, like, the book study, uh, and, and it'd be so boring. And so, my friend, one of my little partners was like, hey, Ray, Ray, Read like Bill Cosby, read like Jesse Jackson, and I do it. <laughs> and I go, oh, this right here is uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, we know that uh, the Rainbow Coalition is not by gay guys. And uh, we know that Jesus Christ was fly. And uh, can I get a witness? Everybody dying laugh. I'm like, Raymond! I'm like, well, this is her. <laughs> but it was so boring. He'd be like, I'm going to kick you. I'm like, I, I, I'm like well, but dad was so boring. Like, shut up, Devin. But it's always like, why you got to make it boring? You know, and it's because the teachers are right. not that happy a lot of times. A lot of teachers yeah. are not like, like, I had a professor who, won't, I, you can tell that instead, he was an economics professor. This yes. dude got a PhD in economics. But you could tell he really just wanted to be a comedian. Mm -hmm. But he was just better at economics. <laughs> <laughs> what an hell, huh? So he would use, he used like his tenure at the college I was at uh -huh. to just do like open mic stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, but it was all... It wasn't like he had. It wasn't like a real open mic. Although when I was a substitute teacher, I just used it for crowd work. Uh -huh. I was in middle schoolers too, so I'm trying to. I'm the. They they already don't want to listen to me because I'm a substitute teacher. Right. And then that the rule, the unspoken rule in middle school and high school is that if you have a substitute, your job, your duty. As a as a student is to get away with as much bullshit as possible yeah. during the period that you have a substitute teacher, and then they, they just don't pay me enough for that. I, I realize sorry about the yeah. I just realized I, I made more like driving, like doing my own. Ain't that amazing? My, so I was just using it for. I was just trying to crowd work. You know, a bunch of little. That's amazing. You know, um, teachers don't get paid much, but you can get paid much more. Uh, um, 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 for doing a construction job, yeah, or, or a basketball player or an athlete, you know. But you would think like they might tear that building down in five right. years. A kid who does not have good, if they, if you don't have good leadership at home, mm -hmm. and then you go to school most of the day, and you don't have good leadership there, those are the kids that get into trouble later. Right. Yeah. That's way. Uh, it's it's a super important job, and I I noticed I mean, you and you know you've been. Uh, uh, but you've been around longer than me, but like <laughs> right. when I, we, you're like ten years older than me, or something, yeah. right? Like eight, something like that. I'm, well, I'm, 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 I'm I don't know. So, uh, wait, what year are you born? Ninety-seven. The weather night. My birth is coming up in the next uh, next month. Uh, when, when were you? You were born in nineteen seventy. Nineteen seventy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly 10 years. Yep. That was 1980. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. So, yeah, so you, I'm sure you're probably aware as well, like, school has dropped off. Like, public school oh, yes. has dropped off in the last, like, 20 years, 30 years. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Now, and the internet messed it up, too, because, like, it was hard to, it was dropping off when I was in school. And, like, you know, we got out. But then the internet happened. And now I'm trying yeah, to substitute, to teach, teach. I'm trying to get kids to listen. And they all have. It was hard enough to teach when they just had a book, like they're trying to read a comic book instead of the textbook, or what they're drawing pictures, or you know they throw a thing and then then it wasn't me, it was her, right, you know, and right. try to confuse the teacher. But now they have every piece of information in the on history the of information in on a phone in their right. pocket, and we can say, don't look at that. Right. You have to listen. To, you have to right. hear about. You know, this is a mountain. This is a plateau. It's like I'm. This is a bored student. I'm. This is a kid who's about to get his phone out in class. And they all have that. And they got did the one that messed me up. I saw some kids when I was substituting. They had a Nintendo Switch set up. Yeah. And that thing's got a screen 
and it's got all the it's got it is a more powerful gaming system than everything I had growing up combined and they got it like they got a phone and they just put in their backpack they got controllers attached to it that Nintendo Switch is so cool <laughs> this looks like such a cool but like you bust that out in class this right. dude school doesn't even have a chance and you'll learn about I Ben Franklin a, shut up yeah I, I, I was a, a little militant smart aleck as a kid cause you know I said uh, cause like my teacher told me today we're gonna learn about George Washington they're like Mr. Cobra what is it? I said well man why are we gonna learn about him he owns slaves I said why well, wouldn't we learn about dude that told a lot of time he never told a lie he chopped down a cherry tree matter of fact here's a dollar I said, what this motherfucker? And they're like, go to the <laughs> And the kids laughing. Oh, I would have called him. And called my fellow, like, what the hell did he do that? I would beat his ass. You know, um. That'd be me picking up the phone, but yeah, Ray Love is acting up again. Yeah, he <laughs> acting up. Come get him. Or, or if a kid was, if a kid was cool, like, they're, like if I got yeah. the joke, I, like they weren't just trying to yeah. make my life miserable, they were actually funny. Um, then you kind of get a pass. I remember one yeah. kid, I was like, man. If we were not in this situation, where this kid's always cutting up, but right. I knew he was a smart kid. He was in a good class, and, right. and he wouldn't, you know. But he was just always doing what he's not supposed to be doing. I'd be like, "Hey, stop it!" And he'd be like, "Okay." And then as soon as I look away, he's doing it again. I'd be like, "Man, if I wasn't a substitute teacher and you weren't a student right now, we would probably be friends." But right now. <laughs> Yeah, you got this. This ain't gonna work, okay, dude. <laughs> like, please stop. But that was like the advanced math class I taught oh, them yeah, for yeah. like two weeks. The teacher got surgery or something, and so I got to know those kids. Oh, so yeah. when you get a rapport with them, but when they, you're just some face right. that yeah, drops yeah, yeah, in, right. like, who is this motherfucker? They see you and they do like an NFL football celebration. They're just like, ah, free right. class. We're going nuts. Yeah. And uh, they do. I, I, I had a uh, teaching when I, when I was in sixth grade. It was funny. Uh, 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 when, they, when we had we had reading time for like 34 40 minutes and what's funny they, they told us make, bring something to read my goof bag I brought a, a comic book I brought Spider-Man and I but you know y'all know how I laugh I've always been had a silly laugh ever since I, ever since I was a young young kid I bust out like everybody like what's so funny and the teacher like Mr. Cobra what the hell is so funny I said man this this is I said first of all it's a comic book I supposed to laugh ain't I and so she said, okay, what's your point? I said, look at this comic Spider-Man. I said, for the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man got married. I said, why this fool got married in, the, in, in, in his Spider-Man outfit? <laughs> Everybody laughed. I said, come on, he couldn't ball a tux. I said, he couldn't be Peter Parker. I said, the whole, talking about this the crazy I ever seen. I said, I know, motherfucker, you ain't even David Bella. And she's like, get out of here. Everybody laughing. Uh, I, I'm talking, about, it's like I'm doing a comedy routine. I'm talking about it. And everybody just crying, laughing. All the kids in that door, what's in there? They looking in the class, cracking yeah. up. So I had them going. Wow, you were disruptive. <laughs> yeah. Or you would say, you were funny. Oh, yeah, I just had them rolling. I'm just coming up with stuff, you know. I'm, I'm imagining Ray Love as a baby without <laughs> laughing like that. Because that, that laugh, is that's how a lot, of, I, I imagine right. a lot of people in the comedy scene they realize because they will hear that laugh sometimes at at times when no one else is laughing. It's just but for whatever I I you're the first person I've ever met who has weaponized their laugh. I will never forget this one time at 18 Ben when they do the open mic. Yeah, you know what you know the story I'm talking about. Hold on, I'm trying to think. Uh, 18 Ben. Oh, well, let me remind you. Okay. Uh, Liz Hader goes up right before you. Okay. You know Liz. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. She's kind of like, uh, like, yeah. like Daria. She's kind of like a salty suburban white lady. Yeah, yeah. okay. But, uh, I don't know. She's pretty cool, I guess. But uh, Liz goes up, and she goes up right after you. So you go up. You uh -huh. do your five. She gets off. Then she, uh, you, you get off. Then she goes up, and then she made a crack about, you know. What, so she said you basically she's insinuated that you weren't funny. She said something sarcastic. Oh, well, I think like I, I, I made the joke about the the, the, the strong women. I, I get whatever it was. Maybe you triggered yeah. her or something. But when yeah. the point is, she took a shot at you, and then for her, and plus it backfired with for her <laughs> entire set. Every single line that she said, you just like 
Like you're shooting, like you're in, like in, like Braveheart, like shooting a catapult, like fuck you, and you just hey. ah, and just hitting her with like extra laughs that she did <laughs> not sign up for. Funny. But it, it, it was exactly that scene from the Nutty Professor where he knocks yeah. out Dave Chappelle. It was exactly yeah. that, where it's like you're laughing so hard at the comedian. It's like, wait, this isn't. Right. Then what's well, going, you know something else makes me was... laugh. Irony makes me laugh. Like when a comedian get on stage, and then when they honestly, when they honest, or, or like if a comedian is overweight, and, and and they say, well, well, I've been trying to die for the last I be what? <laughs> and what I really want to say, that shit ain't working on me. But well, how would it be rude? Well, because if I'm on, it's funny because if I'm on stage and I hear your laugh after a joke, <laughs> I have to check myself to say, well, now, was that funny? Or was Ray telling me it wasn't funny well, yeah, by laughing? I, I, when when something's it, clever, I find funny. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, like the boo honk and me and Jay, we crack yeah. up with that. That's funny. I appreciate um, it. You, you are, yeah. um, like, okay, like, for instance, when a, a woman who's, you know, uh, get up there, and then, and then she said, oh, wow. Um, uh, like, it was one one female. She would get up there and tell me, uh, tell me, I was once a rocket, and my dad be, ah! <laughs> and I'd be laughing. I'm like, shit, you was a rocket? That's what I want to be saying. But I don't want to be, but I'd be laughing. Because I was always laughing at stuff that people say I shouldn't have. Because I know I was a badass kid. I Do you know I got kicked out of a, 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 a play? Because I was on a field trip. Because we went to go see uh, the Wizard of Oz, I called it the Wizard of Oz. Do you believe they they had a Puerto Rican girl playing Dorothy? <laughs> I said that that bitch ain't Dorothy. That's Maria. Everybody laughed. <laughs> the whole day, it wasn't nobody really there. We just there. I'm like, oh, this is some bullshit. Guess what? They had a Chinese dude playing the Tin Man. I'm like, this is some bullshit. I'm like, he ain't the Tin Man. That's the Chin Man. Fuck out of oh, here. <laughs> And guess what? They had a midget, a midget playing the lion. I'm like, oh, please, you ain't lying to your way about his height. Fuck out of here. Man, and I said, like, this is awesome. I was just laughing so hard. I told my parents they was crying. They didn't even beat me. They was laughing so hard. They were like, we going to let them go with this one. I was thinking too, because all the midgets and uh, or little people as they're called now, whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, you know, <clears throat> and the Wizard of Oz, they was all, they had that, they had the whole munchkin land. They, yeah. had, they had an entire population of a city. There were all little people in the Wizard of Oz, and they say like, "Oh, it's hard for little people to get work in Hollywood, you know, or whatever." No, right? No. It's hard. It's hard to get. But then, in this play, they had enough that they filled up Munchkin Land, and then they're like, "Hey, we got one extra. You want to dress as a lion? We can't find a regular size." Right. I was I was just laughing so hard, but everybody was funny. Everybody in the like, whole theater was laughing. The I, I mean, I mean, cu- cu- couple of actors they they couldn't they couldn't fit. They was laughing so hard. That's funny. Everybody in the whole thing was man, laughing because you know the, those the actors ushers was like, crying. They was just dying. They was like, man, we gotta bring this boy back. Dude, He's funny. That's funny. That, they love me. They, I just that's that's how that was the story about Eddie Murphy. I was gonna tell. I don't know if you told you you've heard. You probably have because you mm-hmm. seem like a big Eddie Murphy fan. Yes. But in an interview, he told the story about how he was like six or something, Mm -hmm. and he was on the bus with his mom. Oh, okay. And he would, when someone would get up and walk down that aisle to get off the bus, he would really pay attention to their mannerisms and everything and then he would get up when they got off and he would roast them <laughs> he would make fun of them he'd walk like this he probably this right. that like and and then everyone would laugh as see every one time someone got off the bus but then as the stops went on he realized that people started to realize oh he's gonna do that to me Right. When I get up, so people start laughing more nervously. They're like, uh-huh. "Oh no, how's he gonna?" People probably start walking all weird. Uh-huh. Like, and and then what he said was, when it finally got to the stop where him and his mom got off the bus, he got a standing ovation. Wow. Six, six years old, the bus. He said, "That's when I knew this is what I'm doing." Right. Because well, because see, when he he was in Raw, of course Samuel Jackson was uh when he did Raw, his that's supposed to be him as a little little kid. Yeah. Yeah, and he, he was oh man, hilarious. You know, I just I just like oh man, he just Dude, I don't give a shit what people say. I think the specials hold up. I mean, he does say Oh my god, come on. He he makes fun of gay people really hard, right. but also that's like it's in Yes, yeah, wrong. You gotta understand you gotta understand the context of yeah. that bit. Like yeah. it was 
Okay, it was, it's comparable to like like I can only really only compare it to like Richard Pryor or something because you see like when Richard Pryor would do his stuff, that was the first time you see like a black guy mm-hmm. really characterizing and making fun of white people, and it's funny because white people are like wait do I do I do I really dance like that? And, right. and meanwhile, black people have been making fun of white people yeah. being that way for a long time. Well, uh, white people have been making fun of where you think the black face come from? You know, with the with the big old yeah. lips and, and me being some big ass lips. I got teased for this. I was a kid. <laughs> Since I was a kid, I've been teased about it. I call um, it like a, like a cultural callback where yeah. it's. I, I guess one example would be like where Dave Chappelle. He, he was like, he, like you know, the funniest thing about when he was doing the little John stuff. Yeah. It's like you know the funniest thing about that. White people don't know what skeet means. Right. And that was one of those things where I was like, oh my god, he's right. There's probably a whole shitload right. of stuff that. I don't know what it means because it was just that there's certain there there's just like certain like cultures where they just have their memes and if you're not in that scene you just don't know but it's wildly like like common in certain circles so it's like well, but you and as you see Richard Pryor <clears throat> getting on stage in the seventies mm. and it's all black people mm-hmm. and like four white people that he found right away. <laughs> Or, or maybe more so white people, because that's how it was in the club. Because it's like Richard, who really, um, birthday is coming in two months, who's originally from the suburbs of Chicago. Of uh, he he he's he's originally from Peoria, Illinois. Okay. Richard Franklin Pryor, and also uh, John. Do you know who uh, Red Fox's real name is? Uh. Uh-uh. His real name is John G. Sanford. He's okay. originally from St. Louis, but he had an older brother by the name of Fred G. Sanford. That's where they get Sanford and his son from. All right. Yeah, and uh, Bubba and LaWanda Page, all them were, were chitting a certain comedian were her childhood friend, and he put them all on Sanford and the Sun. Oh. And he spent time in Chicago, and guess what? My father was tight. Yeah, because yeah. my father was a drummer, and uh, he's hello, drummer. He like, man, quit calling me drummer. I'm Ray. And he was smoke. They see him in the back. They, Fred, you need, Red, you need to come on now. Because uh, he got the name Red because his complexion and the fox because his clever and his material. And he put the X's on because it's X rated material. Okay. That's the name Red Fox on from. That's a good stage name. Right. And like everything. Jamie Foxx, whose real name is uh, is Eric Bishop. But he got the name because he sounded like a girl and a guy, Jamie Foxx. Because they're out Foxes. And he put it together. He got Jamie Foxx. That, that is a unique individual Jamie Foxx yes he is that guy's one of the most talented ever boy Same yeah and they're like talented at what man. they're like yes yes he's good at everything and I did not what well, everybody has right to this black people didn't think he was a real comedian I said he started in stand up yeah yeah cause um he's Hope better Flood. than most real comedians he's well but you know what if you look at the guys who are ex- ex- extremely good actors but they're also really good comedians all of them, their comedian style is that Eddie Murphy where it's like he does characters, he does voices, he'll tell a story, but then he plays every character in the story. You know, Jamie Foxx does that. Uh, it, <clears throat> I think like, like um, who's the guy from Rush Hour and Friday? Oh, Chris Tucker. Yeah, he's Great like man. that too. He's like, a, yes. he's like really like a thespian. Woo! You know what I mean? He's like a, Dave really? Chappelle as well. Dave Chappelle is... Uh, I'm sorry. But he is... Uh, Dave Chappelle's done so much acting, but I mean, he's everyone knows Dave Chappelle is like as pure a comedian. I mean, Ooh, he's like, gosh. like he would set up a PA system in DC in the park and just start doing crowd work. And he'd probably do eight hours. He might do an eight hour shift just doing crowd work. Right. And that's why, and then you hear about him going and doing like a, you know, a 10 hour show at the comedy store or something like that, like where people would leave, go to bed, come back. He's still on stage. You know, and it's like, well, people are like, well, how would you do that? We can't do it from like, if you think about an open mic or starting with three minutes, five minutes. But if you start out doing an entire day, like when the sun, you know, when the sun comes up, you set up your PA system and you make fun of people in the park for like eight, nine, ten hours, like, you know, on stage in that environment, it's probably nothing. It's probably easy for him to do. It's probably fun. Well, I put the dressing on, you know, so Dave was like this, you know, I'm Dave Zappel. I'm doing this like that. I said, bam. Coming yeah. in, I'm doing my thing, you know. I have a van. I said, I said, shit, I'm Rick James, bitch. Enjoy yourself. It's Had too much from a Charlie Murphy. Charlie Murphy, yeah. He, he's, he's weird too, because like he's such a good comedian that when he yes. does, he does these hilarious, 
uh, impressions of Prince or, or Rick yes. James, you know, and uh, but and you know it's obviously Dave Chappelle. It's not like Denzel where you like forget yeah. that it's Denzel Washington. Like you always aware that it's Dave Chappelle, but also you but you still get lost in the character mm-hmm. because that's how good he is. But that's like uh, my point is hey, that you got my favorite. Who's that? Hey, you know, mother. I got oh, a chance yeah. to see hear Richard as a kid, seen him on TV. Yeah, and I got a chance to work with somebody who worked with him. Who was a veteran act, uh, uh, comedian? Act, uh, my girl, she played Roz on on uh, on, on Night Court. Uh, oh, uh, um, Marsha Warfield. Yes, who, I saw who's her. Who's also at, from Chicago? I saw her at the the comedy seller. Love her, love her. That's yeah. my girl. Yeah, and she's, she saw me hosting at the studio. I was funny when I brought. I had to. I, I introduced her and she showed her love. She's like, thank you, cool people, man. I was just to say, like that's the style that you have in stand up. Is like where right. you're, you feel, you seem like you have that that Im- impression. You know, it's like you, you were talking about getting into character, and while in comedy, you're not getting into like, you know, it's not like you're somebody else because mm-hmm. you're pretty much the same on stage versus <laughs> off stage. <laughs> you know, authentic, authentic Ray Love. Oh, thank you. But. Uh, but do you like get into character? You get in like comedy mode. Do you have like an actor ritual or something where you? Well, what my thing is, like when you're doing a real show, not when no. you're like fuck around hosting no, the, no, 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 the no, show or whatever. No. Well, I try to uh, Yell stay ready, me. stay ready, so I won't get ready. The main thing I just try to get in tune and I always set up. Uh, of course, read, try to read the crowd and set up what jokes I know is going to be for this crowd. I call myself the ninja comedy. You know, like a martial art, I have my weapons ready, you know. Yeah. Ready to come to fight and get in that ass. Yeah. Regard, and I hate when people talk about, well, you're black. I said, no, I'm a comedian. Because, like, I've done white crowds. I've done all girl, all guys. I've done, you know, little children shows. I've done, uh, you know, elderly people shows. And did my, did my thing, you know. Yeah. Because I used to be a puppeteer, too. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I, yeah, exactly. That's the same thing I'm talking about, though. It's like, yeah. now you got characters, but I got a yeah. character here, yeah. I got a character here, I got a character here, and now yeah. I get to be three people at once. Right, because I have a lot of, oh, shut up, oh, man, oh, today, you know, and, and I, uh, I had these four puppets, and I, I put on the play, I'll do two at a time, and for these... Uh, what the puppets look like? Uh, well, I had, to, I had the old man, the old woman, and I had the two young kids, the grandkids. Okay. And... I, I did it about black kids. It was four black puppets. And they looked so real. And the kids was crap. When they was coming, I was like, oh, shut up. I had the little grandma coming in. Whoop your tail, child. You don't want to this kid. Get away. Shut up, old baby. What's what you're doing to this kid? You know, she remembered. Shut up. And then they cracking up. They, and this before, then I did the thing. Then I did the, uh, I did 30 minute. And I did that for like four different libraries. And it was fun. And I, and I named my couple was Puppet Parlay. And I, 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 I want to get those puppets because it was fun, because I enjoyed it. And, but of course I know to make one, I had to do the window clean, but it's like, I had so much fun doing it. Because I'm, I'm a big cat, little little kids. Kids are crazy about me. And I would read stories for my little kids, for my, not, for my nieces. When they go to bed, like, let me, I want to hear a story. I'm like, oh Lord, I. Right. Yeah. A lot of women I dated, they, they daughter was like, can Ray read me a story? Like, no, nah. they, they were like, come on, I, like, I, I read the story, everybody cracking up. They love it, you know. That sort of makes sense. Like, okay, so I'm, I've been, uh, my kid is three, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and what I noticed, even from when he was couldn't talk or understand uh-huh. words or anything, the comedic rule of threes works on children. Yes. Which is why. So I would be like, doo doo doo, doo doo doo. Blah, and then he always he laughs. It's instinctive. Right. There's the three. There's a. Yeah. There's the two misdirect. Right. And the punchline, which is the exact same structure right. of joke writing that works right. everywhere, but act outs is the same. Mm. I've always thought that act outs are the key to the the, the or what separates a uh, a regular comedian from like a really good comedian. Yes. Because if you look at all the the real top who was the top guy you know we got we got murphy we got Pryor. both of them they're doing impressions they're doing act outs someone who doesn't you don't think about who does act outs but he's actually a fantastic actor and you know everyone knows but like bill burr because when you think about bill oh, burr bill burr so deep you don't Funny. think when you think about bill burr you don't think about like when i think about act outs i'm thinking about 
Eddie Murphy. I'm thinking about like Jim Carrey. You're yes. thinking about oh, Dane okay. Cook. You're thinking about these guys that are like just theatrical and they everything's got a movement attached to it, right? But Bill Burr will use it as a punchline. I always remember this one where he was talking about how hard it is to be a man because you always have this thing between your legs that's trying to get you into trouble, right? <laughs> right. And he was like, if your dick was a third baseman, he'd just be waving everybody home. Like, and he had this thing where he struck this one. It was the way he turned his leg. It's very subtle. He turns his leg. He waves his arm. And it was just like third baseman waving everybody home. Uh. But he did it so well. That it was so convincing, you're like, oh, that he base he like, as an actor turned into mm-hmm. a major league umpire, mm-hmm. uh, 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 referee. What do they call them? Umpires. Umpire. Yeah, yeah. They would got an umpire on the third, like a third base coach, right? Mm-hmm. This would be. Um, Bill Burr is the bomb. I got. He tell turned you that. in, but he's a you know he does so much acting. He does he does yeah. movies. He was yeah. a, he was on Breaking Bad. He's in The Mandalorian. I mean, Bill Burr is doing something right. He's you doing, know what's funny? I didn't know. Um, that Bill Burr said that who his mentor was was uh, Vinny Pavarotti, P- Pavarito, who used to be here. And he was at the uh, Dirty Twelve Thirty. He gave me a shout out. I was like, wow, he gave me a shout out for, you know, I'm, I'm like, and I love, I thought stuff, Big Vinny was funny. And I did not know Bill Burr said it. That, that I said, man, Bill Burr said you was his mentor. He said, yeah. I'm like, for real? Wow. I didn't have no mentor coming up. I just, my mentor was the stage. I learned through trial and error and I'm steady learning. I had comedians give me pointers about certain things. The audience is really a good gauge of, like, comedy is interesting because yeah. I gotta stay, I gotta stop saying like. As I know, Rose watched some of these episodes, I say like before everything. Like, uh, Valley Girl, it's stupid. Mm-hmm. Now I'm trying to think of how to say something without saying like. What was my point? Um. What was I saying right before I scolded no, myself? No, you said comedy is like, you said you want to stop saying like. Oh, that's right. Comedy is a discipline of entertainment where yes. the audience is an active participant. And without an audience, it doesn't really work. Sure, it doesn't. And that's why it's so important when you're learning to have regular people in the audience or to understand how to connect with strangers. Because I was watching, you know... Um, you know Melvin Washington. Oh yeah, right? funny guy. He's so very, very tall. He's, he's super tall. Yeah, man. I feel like a, I feel like the cowardly lion from the play. <laughs> every time I, I see him. Shout out to Melvin Washington. Good every brother. time I see him, you know, uh-huh. so friendly. Cool shake guy. his hand, yeah. give him a hug, cause he likes to hug. Yeah, he's like my dude. two feet taller than me. I feel <laughs> like I'm a little kid, like yeah. just like. <laughs> Good dude, boy. Yeah, but and he uh. That's his big thing too. Mm-hmm. Is he? He's always he prioritizes connecting with the crowd, right? He's got the saying: "I say this, you say. Yeah. I say this, you say. Yeah, 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 this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, and he. Does. That's why I always do that when I say Ray. Y'all say, look, you bring them in my world, and it's like I'm bringing. I'm trying to bring them in. And I'm trying to dissect them, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's but that what it is is like you make them pay attention. It's a public. It's really a public speaking technique, mm-hmm. you know. And you see, and, and the thing is, I, I don't. Can you imagine Melvin Washington doing comedy without a crowd? Uh, oh man! Like, uh, can you imagine? Can. can you imagine Melvin doing Zoom comedy? Oh no! Impossible, right? Mm-hmm. Because he's got to be like right there. You need yeah. to get. And he like makes people interact, but that's the same. The same thing. Like comedy is very interesting because you need an audience. You can't just like practice in the mirror. You know, as a comedian, I was telling, I, I, you know, who, who's also from my hometown that I know from Chicago, who you remember so much of, who's that? of uh, Robin Williams, who was oh god, brilliant, yeah. great actor, funny comedian. Oh my god, I would have loved to have met him and just chopped it up with him. He was man. He was woo. He, he worked with my man Stephen Pearl. Who, 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 who worked with him many times? Another vet comedian. He yeah. Was at the comedy store. I don't know who Stephen Pearl. Stephen is. Pearl is he, uh, him and Carl. I met Carl LeBeau, uh Carl LeBeau, who passed away. Who I was so hurt. Carl LeBeau, he used to work with Sam. He was Sam Kennison's best friend. Wow. Yeah. And I met him in '06 when I'm uh, still young in the game, a couple of years in the game at uh, at Zany's, where I worked at a lot. And so he was on set. I said, this dude is funny. Who is this girl? And he was cracking on my lab, calling me a pirate. I was 
Dying. <laughs> I, I, when I tell you I was laughing, I was falling out my chair. I was like, he is hilarious. I met him. We heard. Every time I would see him, I would go to Zany just to watch him. You were in the audience laughing, and he yeah, he yeah heard and the, audience, the audience was was. Do you know um, he, he he was at the Laugh Factory? Yeah. I laughed so hard. Here in town? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I laughed. I was laughing so hard. He had to stop for like 10 minutes. Because he was just crack. Everybody was like, oh, there it goes again. And I'm laughing. Everybody was just looking at me dying. I had the whole artist laughing. And he said, I knew that was you. Oh, he came and hugged me. When I heard he died, I was so hurt. Oh, that's sad. Man, I was so Because it's it just like, I never got a chance to always see him. He always gave me pointers. Man, I feel like we should go see, uh, we should go to like the Comedy Cellar or something where oh, God, yes. where where you would get noticed by the, because hey, your laugh, like, I, 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 I'm like, is it a fake laugh? Is it no. an accentuated real laugh? And then I think about it's it, not, you laughing like that as a baby, and, and it's so people, funny. I don't know, it's it just natural, and people was like, that's how you laugh for real? And I went to go see another comedian, a uh, guy named Boss, young man. Who, who, who put Boss, on the show? You know Boss. Yeah, Boss the comedian. Yeah, yeah, Boss. I've seen him. Okay. Well, anyway, he had that Michael. Talk some shit, man. He, he, so, he, he, he had he, Michael Blackson, who had me dying. Yeah. And Michael Blackson came out. He just said, "What's that, you?" I said, "Me way laughing like he said, man, I was on stage. I had the morning take Michael. I said you was funny, man, Michael yeah. Blackson. And I, I would see Michael Blackson. Say, What's that? Like I know Hannibal Burris from Chicago, Lil Rev, you know." You talk about an original style, man. Hannibal Burris yeah. is so funny. I still think about that. And it's like his signature bit, I guess, or whatever. About Bill Cosby. I was going to say talk about it. Well, Bill Cosby, that's what he's kind of yeah. known for. Known but for. When I think about just his stand-up, he was talking about how his roommate, he saw it's, it's hard to even articulate the idea of it without going into the Hannibal Burris cadence, you know? Yes. It's like, yeah, my roommate, he all the pickles out of the pickle jar, and now I just got pickle juice, but I don't want to throw it away because it'd be wasteful so now what I do is I make a sandwich and I dip my fingers in pickle juice and I flick it on the sandwich for flavor and he just it like when he does it it's very funny and then at some point I think he flicks pickle juice in his roommate's eyes but it's like <laughs> right. he just talks about like he's like man bubblegum <laughs> like have the he, he's just got such a unique he's from where's he from he's from Chicago Hannibal I Burris remember when Hannibal well, yeah. first started tell you a true story uh, two West Side comedians, Lil Rail, who had a show, and Lil Rail, I'm so proud of him. Lil Rail, who I know very well, he roasted me. We, we did this college called Illinois State. Oh, God, I hate to talk about this story because a comedian that uh, had, 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 had featured on the show is passed away, a young man by the name of Marcus Cone. Hilarious. He, uh, I would see Marcus Cone on the show. It, okay, who? It was uh, Hannibal went up first, it was me. I did this. I did pretty good. Hannibal didn't do too well. I did, I got he was just starting this in 04. He reminds me of Reese the writer. Right. Because he's got like a real quirky, yeah. unique style. Yes. And you think it's going to be one thing. And then he right. starts talking to you like, oh, this is, he's original. Right. right. Like he doesn't remind me of anybody. This right. is something else. And um, and um, Marcus Cohen went up and featured. And, and then uh, this guy named Brian Wildcat Smith went up, who uh, was all, all Chicago comedians. I mean, I did in, uh, in uh, Illinois State, and I was just like, wow. And then when I um, when I seen Hannibal, uh, I assumed he moved to New York like how Jordan Perry do. That's why I said thumbs up to Jordan Perry, because I'm not one of these hate comedians. That's because I've been in the game. Like, no, nah, he ain't saying this is the dude. This is. I'm, I'm, I don't care if you're an open micer or if you've been doing this for 30 years. If you win, I'd like to see you win, male, female. Get it. Yeah. Because this is a tough business it's tough man very competitive very tough and you never know anything can happen man comedy is one of those things too where you see when your friends doing better than you're doing and you're happy for them like it's, right. it's not I'm like, like i'm like that I, i'm right it's not like I, I guess back in the day it was like mm. like more like theater or acting it was like well why did she get that part of right. me you know or whatever but with comedy like mm. i mean like i don't compare myself to Jordan Perry at all. He was on here yesterday, but I ever since the the first time I saw him on a microphone when he came to town a year ago, I was like, dude, this guy is talented. Yeah, he's fun. I, I said, like, like again, but he did improv in Boston. Then right. he moved to LA. Nice. And he, he was living in LA as a comedian doing that. Uh and then COVID happened and right. he came to Vegas for right. a year and now he's just going back right. nice. to 
to Goatsville. He's going back to the goat farm to be a New York comedian, man. He's, I, uh, I'm proud of Jordan. Go ahead, young man. Because yeah. I did improv here at, with uh, John Gilligan. I was going to ask that. You've done improv, too. Yes, and, and I didn't like it. I loved it. It was so fun. It was like ten and a half years ago, man. Shit, was, I bet you destroyed ball. improv, man. I bet, I, yeah, I, bet I, I did really... good. I don't like the two more horn. Because like, one thing, I like to remain humble. People, man, you killed that scene. I'd be like, all right, you say so, thank you. But... I don't like that. I just never was like that. That kind of cat, like the two more I don't like to come yeah. off as arrogant. Well, you, you it, there's like weird. There's a weird idea that ego is good in some yeah, arenas, in some arenas. show business. Where if you act like if you're an influ, like right now especially, yes. with social media and influencers mm-hmm. and YouTube, the more fake and bombastic and like yes. look at all the me and blah, blah I'm cool and you're not whatever that whole thing is a character but that goes farther in some place and other in comedy right. it only goes as far as if you get the joke like you could do right. that like a like Cat Williams where he talks right. about like uh, uh, right. he, I don't know he, he, he I don't know you listen to Cat yeah, I like oh Cat Williams is uh, his those first couple of specials that he did it was about as funny as comedy gets. And, and guess what? All act outs, mm-hmm. right? That guy will make a punchline, but then he will deliver the punchline while he's acting. I remember the one where he talks about how he got shot. And he just slide, he slides the stool as he falls down. So it's a very slow cartoonish, like, mm-hmm. I'm obsessed with mime yeah. and saying the word like. I got to stop it. Mm-hmm. But this is... So mine, right? The these guys. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm laughing. You know, I'm laughing because you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. No, no. Go, go, go ahead. All right. Mime is the highest form. So if communications, if if public speaking, the highest level is stand up comedy mm-hmm. because you can make them laugh and give them information. A mime is just a little higher than that because they do all that same stuff and they don't even talk. Right. Because when I saw, I used to want to be a rock and roll guy, right? So oh, I really? Play music. I okay. Play music. I want to be in like a grunge band or an alternative okay. rock band. That was my dream when I was a kid. Okay. And then I got into fighting because I was durable enough. And I was a martial arts nerd, and I was like, well, I can be good at this, and I don't need to round up four other people and hope that we get along and can play our right. instruments and, and vibe, right? And then comedy is even simpler because comedy yeah. is just you and a microphone and your writing yeah. and your performance. But a mime will do everything. I saw so I saw Chris Rock, Bigger and Blacker, classic special. Love right? it. One of my favorites. And I just at some point I realized Beast. This guy is doing the same thing that Aerosmith is doing. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I never looked at it. You him. go you're filling a venue. You're getting a bunch of paying customers. You're getting pay-per-view. People want to see it. Yeah. And he doesn't have a guitar. He doesn't have cool ribbons hanging from his microphone. He's just him and a microphone and some slippery shoes. And that was it. It was just him and his microphone. And that it, big and black. Of, Chris and, is one of my favorite. Chris and that is live a and, beast. That live in La Vila Loca punch, right? Yeah. You remember that? He goes, yeah. he's live in La Vila Loca. And he slides with his, his shoes. That's... That's all he had instead of a guitar, you know, and his mic. But I'm like, this guy's doing the same job as Aerosmith with just a microphone in his right. brain. I said, that's high level. That's yeah. crazy. You know, it's funny. Uh-uh. I, I went. To, I, I did a show at this at this in the circuit uh, joint. Well, what it was, you know, they called it the Chitlin Circuit. They be cooking chitlin, like you know, in the you know clubs where what was predominantly black, like in the hood. Yeah. Well, I, I did this show and they and uh, they didn't have my money yet, so I, I was like, "Oh, we gonna pay?" You know, I said, I said "Man, but I I told you I, I can't go until I get paid." So then I went up there, so I, I was a man. I, I said, "Well, I ain't gonna tell you." I was just when I ain't do no joke. I was just like this, <laughs> and they was laughing, and I'm like, "Fuckers cracking up," and I'm like, I'm just dancing. I'm like, I'm like. And they cry, laugh, and they just falling out. I'm like, damn, this is a man. That's funny, man. So you went up and just did a oh, man routine. Right, you know. just, but, but, and you I was know. like, I was doing like this. And I was moving my chair like this. I was like, 
Dude, I thought about doing that. I where? pulled out a stick of gum. They were just crying. Uh-huh. I'm like, I was like, pull it. I was like, they were just cracking. I was That's just so improvising, and, and they were just like, your improv game is sick, man. They said, a oh, man, these three good came to hug me. It was like, you was the fun. I was like, well, thank you. I said, I'm just, they have my money. I'm just telling y'all, I won't go do no jokes. <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the hit and you killed like, with no words, right? And, and the dude was like, "Man, could you come back?" I said, "Could you pay me back, motherfucker?" Yeah. <laughs> and then it was just that I got paid, and then I got paid a little extra, which is cool. That so, show, yeah, okay. You know what, man? You really got me serious thinking about this now, man. Just doing this interview, it just I just feel like I've been wasting my time all these years just doing all this other stuff. But I know I got to keep money in my pocket and and keep food, but I, 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 for years ago, I knew what my true calling is. I know now, but it's like, damn. Because it's, it's just like, I had some, I, I just think about it when I talk about show, how much fun I just had on Even when it was a bad show. At, at uh, Pizza Melody? No, I'm talking, period, just doing comedy. Just in general, yeah. Yeah, just anything in the entertainment. That's what I know. I just, you know, I just, I have fun. You're you a know? ham, dude. You're a ham. You like to get on stage. You like an audience. You like to perform. But you... Man, you say I'm a ham. I don't even eat pork. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> why, that's probably why you don't eat it. <laughs> right. And what's funny, my ex-girlfriend was fat. But uh, I'll come a little bit. See? So you give me good. I can... But it's not, it's not like you didn't like her. It was your girlfriend. So, yeah. So yeah. haters, calm down. You know what I mean? Give Ray, give Ray a call. If you're a big girl and you're nice. Well, <laughs> I like big in certain areas, not big all, you know. I can't. I hate when women talk about she's a round and girl. Like, bitch, you just round. Yeah, it's symmetry, not size. You right. Got, you, you got know. a little symmetry, come talk to Ray. Right, you know. <laughs> now, now, if you shop at Lane Bryant, bitch, no. <laughs> if you shop at Size Unlimited, uh, it's unlimited for you to fuck with. Dude, I, I have, I've been gaining weight. Over the last year, because I haven't been, I haven't been training, because oh, no. I was a professional fighter, and then right, I came I, back. we know that, yeah. And he's the bomb, y'all. I saw some of his fights; he was good. I was, and then I got, I got, uh, well, I, well, I can't. I, I stopped competing because I realized I don't have the eye of the tiger, right? To reference Rocky Three, right? My favorite Rocky. Where he, oh, he goes man. to L.A. and train uh, with Apollo. Man, That's man. my favorite way. And, but then also Ooh. he does the rope-a-dope on Clubber Lang. Yeah. That was right out of, of yeah. George Foreman, Muhammad Ali. Yep. Mm-hmm. That fight. And he learns how to, he learns his footwork. Right. And, and, and then and they put Polly down in South Central, wherever mm-hmm. they were at. I and you know, movie. Mr. T is from my hometown, Chicago. He's a bouncer back Dude, in the Mr. Day. T's a cool dude. He's still alive, right? He probably looks exactly the same. Man, that dude was, man, I was scared of him. Man, he was swole in that movie. They need to get Eddie Murphy and Mr. T together for something while they're right. both still <laughs> doing I wonder when Mr. T, what his last thing, or if, I feel like Mr. T would be like on Nickelodeon or something now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he, 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 he was good. always, he was so equally, equal parts Whole, so I guess is right. He's equal parts wholesome and like empowering, but also he's universal in that you can put him in an R rated action movie or you can put him on Sesame Street. He's still exactly the same and everyone loves him just as much. He didn't have to change anything, right? And then you see, it seems like an act, yeah. But you, I'm like, man, it's like flavor, flavor. So it's like, oh, oh that's God. just who that well, guy man. is. Have you ever hung out with Flav? No, I met him here in Vegas though. Because he lives, he lives here. Yeah. Like, Fitzy's bum. Fitzy's hung out with him twice, on yeah. accident. Well, once. This is a crazy. I, I, well, I'll let Fitzy tell it when uh, when he's on the show, but he might not. So I'll tell it now. He was he got uh, he had a breakdown and a car pulls up and all these dudes jump out and it was Flavor Flav and his his buddies, and they like helped him push his car like off the off the road and and they had this whole like positive just just doing a good deed just being a little boy scout Mm -hmm. you know just saying hey this guy needs some help let's help him out and then he's bumped into him a couple of other times i forget his other flavor flavor story i saw flavor flavor twice uh once at a nightclub that i worked at Mm -hmm. when they were when they were busy you know Mm -hmm. it was kind of a cool place to be at and just saw him and that was neat and then I saw him again at the Apple Store at Town Square, and he was like just there with a couple of his kids, just looking at computers, 
You know, it's cool living here. I like living in places with landmarks and places yes. where you bump into famous people because it's like, I'm here for sure. You right. know, it's not like being in some question mark town in Kentucky or Mississippi right. or you're, you know, you're, you're in just some, some town. Like you're, you can always look out and be like, oh, there's the Las Vegas Strip. Right. When I lived in Singapore, it's like the Marina Bay Sands. It's ridiculous casino that's shaped like an elephant. Mm. It's huge. It looks like something out of Star Wars. Oh, okay. The Marina Bay Sands. And I lived on, uh, I lived, I was living in a bunk bed in a gym oh, as a wow. coach, right? But we were in that neighborhood and you would walk out and there's like water. There's like, there's like, there's boat, boat quay, which is like, it's weird. It's like a, like a water canal. Where there's like a port and then there's a walkway. Singapore is a, a really mm. interesting place. But then you look when you came out and you had just have this giant casino elephant thing mm. and I was like I want to go play some poker because I come from Las Vegas and I like you know I was like I'll take some of this money and go do that Singapore. you mm. needed to have your passport and it was like an $80 cover charge to get into the casino to lose your money that's how much they like to gamble Singapore. in Singapore what, what, what was so Singapore is in Southeast Asia it's mm. attached to Malaysia which is south of Syria. which is south of Thailand mm. and uh, it's right near Indonesia it's not very far from Australia it's not very far from China so it's like that right. you know it's, it's, it's basically over by China yeah. and there's a lot of Chinese speaking people Singapore is more of a city that's like the banking capital of Southeast Asia it's like a business and money capital so it's like the London England of Asia it's like the New York City of Asia Singapore but the difference is is that Singapore is technically its own country and it's attached to Malaysia, which mm. is also its own country, but Malaysia is like a jungle. Like, mm. you know, in Mississippi or in Las Vegas, right here, right? You have a vacant lot, it's sand, maybe a couple of bushes, you know what I mean? In Malaysia, if it's a vacant lot, it is Indiana Jones jungle. Wow. Straight yeah. up. There was a tribe of monkeys that tried to eat my girlfriend's chihuahua a bunch of times. Damn. Dude, mm -hmm. they were the neighbors. They're like, yo, you look lost, homie. Like th these guys, they were, they were about three, four feet tall, and they would run all along the fence when I'd walk the dogs. They'd be like, well, get that fucking chihuahua. Like oh, they would, the they, they try monkeys? to reach underneath the fence and stuff. Oh, the monkey, monkey. Yeah, yeah, no, these are these are these are like they got these white. This one, the alpha jumped down and flexed on me, oh. like he flexed on, like he, you know, when when people stand up and their arms come out and they like put their, they're like, what's up, you know, like. Like, is it, are we doing this? You know, a monkey did that to me. He's like three feet tall. Damn. He jumped down. I had the two little, it was a men pen and a chihuahua. So these two little dogs uh -huh. and I always walk them. And, and uh, the monkeys are strong though. People dude, understand. They, there's so many monkeys over there, man. They, they are, uh, they, there's, it, there's a place called Batu Caves. Mm -hmm. Dude, ba I used to live right by it when I lived in Malaysia. And this is a giant, Malaysia's all mixed up. It's a country where, it's sort of equal. There's a lot of Chinese influence because it's close to Singapore. And be, the main thing, I think, is that it's easy to wash money because the laws aren't that strict. It's like Mexico, mm. but then you drive an hour and you're in London. Mm. That's what Malaysia and Singapore are kind of like. Mm. It's like, so you have a, a country where the laws are played a little bit loose. You know what I mean? You get a ticket, you don't pay the court, you pay the cop. You know what I mean? That type of... Dynamic, And then you have Singapore, which is way stricter than America, way stricter than London. They got cameras everywhere. They got a 0% crime rate. But that's also the place where they will, they'll, they'll, they'll take you to court and whip you with bamboo if you steal signs or whatever. That's Damn, what I remember that kid yeah. in the 90s? That Man, there, yeah. there was a, and there was some kid who vandalized something that he shouldn't have vandalized, which you're not supposed to vandalize anything in Singapore. And they took him, and they tried to. It was a big deal in America. They're like, "Oh, he's going to get caned. That's the sentence. They're going to cane him, which means they're going to they take him to court and whoop his ass with a bamboo uh -huh. stick." That was they still. And but, bamboo sticks hurt. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And Woo. in America, they were, they were like, "Oh, this is so bad. This is brutal punishment." Blah blah. But man, no, they they still whoop that kid's ass. You know, and Jeez. that's a that's a place you do not fuck around. They straight. They this is a real story. I was down there. I got there. I had a one-way ticket because I was going to corner my fighter, uh, this woman. And, yeah. she and her uh, she and her girlfriend were down there 
for the fight, and they'd gotten there early. They'd driven because the thing is only like two hour drive from mm-hmm. Kuala Lumpur to Singapore. Wow! Because it's like the countries over there are like states, mm. but they all have totally different histories and con- and, mm. and currencies and all the you know, and they yeah. they how, how 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 beautiful was it Singapore? It, it's it's every post well Singapore is like the most one of the most beautiful cities like you'll ever see, and they have also. Uh, these two giant towers in the middle of the city that are connected by a bridge and these towers like malls offices I'm sure wow, there's probably really? some super a lot of really rich people like if you have a, a work visa in Singapore you're making wow. you're making let's like Dubai or something uh-huh. like like the everyone just has a little more okay. the, every prices are higher things okay. cost more I went to Chili's and me and this girl we went mm-hmm. to Chili's for lunch Wow, and they have Chili's franchise like they do here, right? Nice. Chili's. I know they got McDonald's there too. Yeah, yeah, they got that. That's when all the Asians started getting fat. Is when they started getting our fast food. Got an incoming call coming in. They love what here? Yeah, nine eight eight twenty six hundred. So I don't want to put it in. Oh, don't worry about it. It's not showing up on your screen. Uh, it's not showing up right here. Yeah, no, that's all right. Okay. I'll call them back. Okay. Hey, let me ask you. You know, I really want to go to what's up? Uh, what a Nike sweat shop is that? One I want to go in uh, uh, Beijing, China. I want to go there. You want to go to Beijing? Yes. Why? Because I want to see and I want and I want to see. Uh, I would like to see if I can visit the Nike sweat shop. I know it's probably man, you can't go in there. But... You want to go to Beijing to visit a sweat shop? <laughs> Just to see what what they make the Nikes at. Why? Because I just like to just just see it and, and of course buy some uh, some some of my favorite shoes that I order stuff from online from. Yeah, that's yeah. I I was in. I've never been. My cousin lived in Beijing for like twelve years. Wow, for real. Yeah, what and did, what did he say it was like? Well, I, they his daughter, they his wife and his daughter moved back to Louisiana. Okay. Uh, after living there for so long. Okay. And his daughter, who was a toddler. Hmm. Did not know what grass was. Wow. Yeah. And I was, I had a, was on my way to a fight in China. I did a few fights over there. Mm. And I had a layover in the Beijing airport. Mm-hmm. And you ever seen that movie, the, is it the, the Mist, the Stephen King movie? No, I see that. No. Where it, it basically, the government is doing some experiments, uh-huh. and all this they they basically open up a portal and all these monsters come out. But this, this mist comes as a Stephen King book, and they, mm. they made a movie out of it. It's pretty good, and all this mist and the whole city is just covered with this dense, dense, dense fog, and there's monsters in there grabbing people. Wow! And it's just that crazy. But the the the, the story focuses on a group of people that are in a grocery store when it happens. And they see some crazy stuff happen outside, and so they just say, "We got to lock the doors and just hold out in this grocery store till this thing passes," you know. And so, the, and it, but it's just like this, this smoke mm-hmm. on the door, you know. That's what it's like in the Beijing airport because mm. the air quality is so bad; mm. it's so bad you can't see the sky. It is like a, it's like a Mad Max. It's like a, it's something crazy. They have, wow. but it's also a big time. Like everyone thinks they're going to go into China and start doing business. My cousin was trying to do import export. He, right. he had a degree in international business, so he uh-huh. goes over to China, starts a business. He learns the language, and he's trying to do all his networking. And he was working on furniture because you can uh-huh. get really nice Asian style furniture, handcrafted. It's good. It's you know good stuff. You can get it for way cheap, and then sell it in America for way a lot of money. Oh, of course. Right? That's what I got so, the Jordan shoes. I wonder if the shoes are more expensive because that, that's a weird thing. Man. That's where you get into some creepy territory too because they, uh, let me tell you, dude, uh, black markets, black markets, black markets. Yeah. Talking about supply and demand, you want to talk about where are we getting the contraband and mm-hmm. that could that could be drugs, that yeah. could be bootleg t-shirts, right. that could be human organs, right. that could be children, mm-hmm. all of that. The Chinese are on like the cutting edge of that and when I was in Southeast Asia no matter what countries I was at there were Chinese people washing money wow yeah because they can they print stuff that's what how it works you you get money that's not official uh-huh. you put it through a black market and you wash it or you have like a lawn a, a literal laundromat 
or you might have a fake gym or a big organization or something, and you report your earnings, but really what you're doing is you're taking this illegal money, putting it in that account, saying, oh, we made this money at the furniture shop. My cousin will wash the money. <laughs> but, wow. But it's like, oh, we... we uh, we made this much money, report that to the government. The government's like, all right, and then that's that's legal money now. Mm-hmm. That's why the war on drugs is a massive money washing right. operation. Because if you, like they make coffee illegal, it's just gonna make a black market for coffee. So when Clinton passed the North American Free Trade Agreement, I'm gonna get off my little soapbox after this, but when he when he passed the North American Free Trade Agreement, it made it easy to get he says like, oh, is we're gonna expand open borders and blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. But really what it was about was about getting the drugs in the country and mm-hmm. making it hard to get the money out of the country. Because once right. that had been through that, they would just load up all this cash that was coming in off the streets in these warehouses. And then, you know, maybe one in 10, the DA would bust them, mm. scoop up that cash that's washed right. now. It's off the books. Mm, so wow. you can use that money for whatever. Right. I had a DA agent come into our economics class in college and explain wow, all this. For this real? dude red pilled the shit out of us. Yeah, because wow. he used to be a DA agent. He was like, freeze DA, and then one of his friends would get shot. That was his job. And so what? he was like, why are we all getting shot over over weed? What the fuck? Because he was looking at the scheduling of it, how the government organized uh-huh. it. And you were talking about like institutional racism. I know you don't, but I do. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like, but people talk about that. They're focused on the wrong stuff. Right. They're not focused on institutional means. The institution is behind it. The institution right. is making laws. You got to look at how the laws, a couple of steps down the chain, affect society as a whole. Because you will always see that if it is something like that, it will affect a specific demographic. Here's an example: during the Vietnam War, Richard Nixon was having trouble getting people. They were having this whole hippie revolution. You had a bunch of hippies, you had a bunch of Mexicans, had a bunch of black people. They're smoking weed, they're doing acid, they're giving each other hugs, they're getting along. They ain't trying to go to the Vietnam and shoot nobody, right? Peace they love, that, peace yeah, love, not war. Like, yeah, man, they're like, no, I'm not getting drafted. I'm not gonna do it, right. right? This is like Muhammad Ali, same deal. He's like, mm-hmm. I'm not gonna do it. I'll give him my whole boxing career. That's, I'm not, I'm not involved. I'm not getting yep. involved in that shit. And so he thought, well, what do all these people that don't like what I'm doing have in common. Is there a way I can throw all of them in jail? Mm-hmm. And that's what Let's happened. make all of the drugs they like, which are the drugs that make you want to be a better person, right? right. They make you want to make friends. and it, Weed. Yeah, weed, acid, mushrooms, whatever, the psychedelics. Those are all Schedule 1. But the Schedule 1 criteria is it's got to be really addictive and kill you. Well, they do the opposite of that stuff. But they made a Schedule 1 anyway so that if you get – so the cops see a bunch of hippies hanging out. Right. They go to a music festival. They just get a big fishing net, and they just catch everybody. Mm-hmm. Now none of them can vote yeah. because they're felons now. Right, so you create a black market in order to subjugate a demographic. And I don't know what got me started on that, but well, China, China, as far as far as like black market and like uh, the the rule that it freaked me out, dude. I gotta be honest, you freaked me out. You want to go visit a sweatshop like that because it's, they're all kids, right? Mm-hmm. Those are kids that work there. Yeah, like and they don't necessarily want to, but they they have the same. What is it? They have nets around the bottom so that the people who, when they try to kill themselves, because it happens all the time, because they're Damn. trapped there, they, they, they can't do it. <laughs> they can't even. Damn. That's, that seems like, that seems like, like, I, I don't, I don't, I think that there's most likely a strong connection between sweatshops and human trafficking. Because if you think about it, these are kids that are workers. You need another worker, you can go get one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. Like, yeah. Also, some of those, those shoes are pretty dope, though. And yeah. you, you can get the best bootleg shit in, in Asia, though. You go to those markets, yeah. and you can get... The, it's like um, they'll have these stands where they just have these these boxes of these T-shirts. And yeah. you, can print, yeah, you can print any T-shirt you want and sell it. They, they don't really enforce the rules there. They're like, hey, you know, ah. unless you're taking money away from someone who... How much was the shoes there? I don't know. They're cheaper. Uh, it's yeah. cheaper. It depends on what country you're at, too. Like Singapore, you're probably going to pay extra. But in, like, Thailand and China, you know, you probably pay a little bit less. It probably depends on where you're at, too. Because you do the street markets, you're dealing with bootleg stuff. Right. But it looks authentic. Some of it might be. You know what I mean? It is all from there. I don't know. That's my little, like, black market soapbox. I talk about it way too much. I re- I've had Tino and Trez on here. We don't need it. Oh, okay. We don't need I know in grade school, the girls, they used to go with the guy do that. What's the capital of time at? Bangkok. I'm like, bitch, I don't <laughs> <laughs> do that old corny, goofy shit. I walked right into that one. Mm-hmm. 
So you want to? So my point with I guess with Beijing, mm-hmm. China's nuts in general because mm-hmm. they're not exactly first world or third world. Right. They're communist, mm-hmm. and they they're effective. They get a lot. They they accomplish their goals, but they don't do it with the, a sense of uh, ethics that that Western culture has, where they're like, okay, you have to have a legal age limit and you can't do this because that's not fair to them no. intellectual property like if you write a computer programmer like if you're a computer programmer you want to go to America otherwise the government automatically owns anything you do like if you're going to make the new Facebook and stuff that's what they have one app for everything you know that wow, their Instagram really? their PayPal their, it's, it's a thing called WeChat and it's like a messaging app but you can get videos and news and it's all on that one app so when we come up with a new thing, they just copy the code and paste it, and they say, okay, it's ours now. Like, there's no, like, hey, that's mine. I can see you for it. They just had, no had a of mine, he, he went to uh, Beijing. He was a pimp. <laughs> How that for real. Yeah, you know, he, he had a couple of Asian prostitutes. Okay. Yeah, he, he called one of his girls Chinko. I was like, man. <laughs> that seems offensive. <laughs> <laughs> that comes off as... <laughs> <laughs> right. That's what really he Comes off as he, I feel like there people would. That's not the, but also you know. I guess it. I guess it's also accurate, to a degree. What? So wait, your friend was a pimp in. I'm. I'm just bullshit. I'm just being silly. Oh really? <laughs> I just used to do that in there. I was just thinking like it probably wouldn't be that hard to be a be a. Um, I, it, you probably it, do well in China running women because there's not that many women. It's not, Damn. right? Because they had the one, the one. Well, they, the families want like a son. Oh, okay. Right, and they had the rule that said you could only have one kid unless you want to pay extra. They had the one child policy. Damn. I don't think they have it anymore, but they had it for a long time. It affected a couple of generations of that country, and now they got way more men than women. And that's why they have, I don't know, a lot of weird weird sex stuff comes out of Asia. I think a lot of it's just because these dudes who don't know how to interact with women, they just kind of, it's a bunch of little like. Right, horny cats. I don't know. I've been watching. experience. Damn. I've been, so, so if you have a, a, a gaggle of chicks, like you, you probably. Singapore. You probably, no, not Singapore. Uh, but although. China. Maybe there's pimps in Singapore too. There's pimps everywhere. All right. Pimps are everywhere. And with a country called Singapore, you think they'd be broke as hell. <laughs> they have. Uh, I worked for a guy who ran massage parlors, karaoke, oh, yeah. and boat noodle restaurants. Massage parlor, huh? And he made a fake gym because his girlfriend wanted a gym because uh-huh. he couldn't do a boat noodle restaurant. He already, wow. he already rented the space. This guy is running women. And washing money, and all this dude is a straight up gangster, straight wow. up gangster from China, and he's like just created a fake contract for me to be a coach. That's how I ended up in Malaysia in the first place. Yeah. I was working for I don't know if he was a triad. That's like the the gangsters yeah, the of gangster China, triad. right? But but he was a gangster 100. percent But so many people do gangster stuff and wash money in Malaysia. It like wasn't that big of a deal because it's just that. The culture of it is like the the police and the politicians and the gangsters, they all hang out in the same place. Damn. And they just figure it out. Damn, they hang out in the same place? Yeah, it's wild. Wow. Yeah, it's it's there are a lot of like the, the the gangsters in China the triads work directly for the Chinese government. Wow. There was a program where they gave this the government sent out this this free app for playing poker or something. They gave okay. you a certain amount of fake money. And then uh, you could you could put down real money, but you could lose it and you'd end up with like, like a straight up gambling debt. Uh, and the government would send the triads to these people's houses to collect. Yeah. Like they're in cahoots. They just get it done however it needs to get done. And if anyone's in the way, you disappear. Yeah, that's gangster right there. Yeah. I think they might have cloned me. Yeah. I might be the clone. I might uh, not even be the original Dave. Damn, you never know. Because once I went to the airport and they got it, you go and you you give them your you you they you put your fingers on a pad right. and they take your fingerprints. It's on the way into the country, and then you give them the passport. And then the last the last time I, did, I went there, 
I did the fingerprints. I got on my passport. I was going to hand it to the guy. He says, we already know who you are, David. You're good to go. Damn, for real? I was like, you don't even need my passport to get into Singapore. Wow. I Not Singapore. I'm Shanghai. We're in Shanghai. Yeah, it's like, wow. you know, they're like, yeah, we're, we're good. We got a clone of you floating in a jar somewhere, dude. We're going to we're gonna swap you out. That's supposedly where uh, the Chinese connection was there. Well, they told him, yes, leave Shanghai. And he told Bruce Lee that. When he saw, and that movie, The Chinese Connection, one of my favorites. Yeah, one of the originals. Yeah. That was like Bruce Lee's, he was like Fist of Fury was the first one. I think so, or something. yeah. I, well, I, he was acting as a kid, though. I'm such a inner the dragon fanatic. Oh, that's, my that's God. That's the... Is it is it the best kung fu movie of all? Not kung fu, but is it the best like martial, martial arts? Oh movie? man! And what's funny, people don't know that Samuel Hung was in there when when, when he had all those Hell Kempo, yeah, Kempo Hung. Yeah. See, Kip, and I did the man. People was like cause, uh, martial law. Remember that show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Samuel, good one. Because Samuel had to be about nineteen twenty. Because Bruce Lee was like thirty some. Because I know Bruce Lee had like because him and uh, I don't know no Samuel Hung and uh, Jackie Chan were both from the same dojo. Yeah. Yeah, together. They grew up. Yeah, they had that they crazy style. Do you know, yeah. Jackie Chan wasn't originally a martial artist. He yeah. was a, he was like, a, he went to like the Hong Kong School of Dance and Theater. Yeah, He's like that. an actor, theater, yeah, dance, yeah. Yeah. and drunken fist boxing, that, yeah. that style yeah. that he practices, he invented that yeah. for the movies. He said he would never have, he had kids when having him that train. I was like, but when I good this one, he was like, no, nah, because he said it was too hardcore. They would get, uh, go to, uh, they would practice from 5 a.m. waking up to midnight every day, Sunday through Sunday. That's crazy. Could you imagine that, man? No. No, <laughs> no I can't. He said, I, I can't imagine training six hours a oh, day. Wow. Yeah, you know, much right. less, what is that? It's like 100 hours a day. That's too many yeah. hours. Yeah, because, because, um, it's too much. There is such a thing as too much kung fu, right? Well, I think too, I think too much anything is good because, um, I found that Bruce Lee, he used to train like 11, 14 hours daily. I said, what? Yeah. Well, he's not powerlifting that whole time. It's not like right, he's not talking about just, just, just training. Pick, mark, yeah, mark. just reviewing his techniques yeah. and stuff. And I'm like, that that is a, a long time. 14 hours? Come on, when do you sleep, man? This... You you had some martial arts experience. Yes, yes. Yeah, what did you do? Well, like I said, at 15, I had took up... Uh, uh, Karate. I, I took up a uh, um, Okinawa karate, and I got my, my yellow belt in that. What time did you spar in that? I sparred a little bit. Was it point sparring or was it like the chest punch? Uh, uh, we we, uh, they, uh, we we just put on some pad and spar. But then when I went to college, uh, this 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 guy, this crazy dude, was uh, he was he was um, doing Fobin and it, it, the name of the style was Fobin and HDM martial arts. His name was Michael Pimble. And he's my seat. He was he would come to the dorm. I was in an all boys dorm called Carver Hall in in, in 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 college at Howard. So he was down there and he saw I was tall, skinny young man. And he like my kid. He saw me. He was like, wow, this is a tall young man. He's like, you got good kicks. So he's like, man, you like training? I was like, sure. So I told him I, I had my little martial background. So then I was training with him. And then I took a test and I got my yellow belt with that. And then he also used me. He was and he was. A number of styles. It, it had Aikido with it. He was teaching us boxing and stuff like that. And I know he was. I was like, ah. And he would always tell me, stand. Don't don't stand so tall. And I know every time he wanted to spar, he would always used use me. I'm like, oh lord. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were tall when you were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you yeah, were, you yeah, were yeah, like yeah. a tall. You were yeah. like a tall, athletic. Yeah, tall skin. Yeah, tall athletic skin. Kid, you, right. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, we talked about this before, yeah. but you, did you say you ever played sports, or you played for a little bit and then it didn't work out? Or well, no, nah, I, um, I mean, I would play it, and I didn't play for school. Like in the neighborhood, I would hoop with the homies. You know, I would play football, play a little softball, stuff like that. But like, I, what I wanted to do was boxing. That was my thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I really wanted to do because I, uh, I loved it. Like I said, watching Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard. I was like, new guy was just phenomenal. I was just like, damn. Well, I think combat sports are a lot like yeah. stand-up comedy in the yeah. sense that, one, it's, it's all you. Right. Uh, two, you're going to feel bad if it doesn't go well. Ooh, yeah, and, man. Who you telling? And how I wrestled you... a little bit, though. In, okay. In school, I did. Yeah, okay. And you, I know you told me you did, too. I didn't, I didn't wrestle. There was no wrestling in school. I didn't, what? When I was in Mississippi in the 80s, in the 90s, I did not realize wrestling was a sport. 
Mm. I I didn't realize that there was actually a combat mm. sport that you could get a scholarship for or do anything. Wow, yeah. My friends and I, when we found out, we were like, oh, I wish we had had wrestling in school because we would have yeah. all been all over that because we were always trying to tussle and wrestle and all yeah, of that. Yeah. And then there, every once in a while, there'd be someone like me who I guess I had like that that one psycho thing that made me want to be really, really good at fighting. So I just got obsessed with it. Right. I think I would have been... But then it's so it's so rough. I might have gotten hurt. You know, a lot of those wrestlers yeah. they have a short shelf life because yeah. wrestling is so brutal. You know, yeah. So oh tough. yeah. If you talk to anyone, if you if you went to college and you did like Division One and you had a wrestling scholarship or something, from my understanding, it doesn't matter what your degree actually was at the end. You majored in wrestling. That right, was your, yeah, yeah. you know, if you you have a degree in chemistry, that's your minor. Wrestling right. is your major. Like so much to train it three times a day. Uh, yeah. My buddy wrestled yeah, Division weight. One. He said that they we got on the team to find out what weight class you would be representing. You would cut as much weight as you could. Then you get to the lowest. You get to the, low, get to the <laughs> yeah. lowest weight class you possibly could. Right there, and you're already a, a go. You're already a badass wrestler from high right. school, uh, but you know, all right, you're in the college leagues now, so you're going to cut down as much as you can, and then you're going to compete at the weight class below that. Okay, and that's like day so, one, and then they're getting up, at, you know, getting up at five a.m. and running ooh. stadiums and lifting weights and right. then taking, then going to breakfast and going to class, and then yes. coming back to the second practice. How long was, did he say they were training? I mean, I think it was like three times a day. Like, and then when you how many hours would they train? Uh, About an hour. Let's say each workout. Let's you know, three hours a day is a lot. I mean, it might be an hour and a half each workout, right? Because you got to think about the team, locker room, change up, change right. down. You know, the actual workout, whatever it was. I've had conditioning workouts, which were all I needed to do. Like I was like my body couldn't do anymore. Like, but only thirty minutes. But that, in MMA, it's structured really? that way because the longest MMA fight you're going to fight is going to be 30 minutes. Right. So it's all about how much can you cram into 30 minutes, not how long can you go for. You know, my workouts now, they'd be like about an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, about... yeah. And cause that's me, including me wrestling. Like, if I, uh, like when I would jump, when I would jump rope, I'd jump rope for them like 50 minutes. Skinny and navy. Yeah, like, damn. They used to do that in Thailand. The warm ups for uh, the Muay Thai workouts at the Thai whew. gyms. You just jump rope for thirty minutes. Damn. One round, thirty minutes. Damn. Yeah. Or you you run three miles first thing in the morning, mm. and you come back to your first. You you would be conditioning early early in the morning, mm-hmm. and then you have your afternoon mm. training session, which is two hours, and then your evening training session, which is two hours. And I know Tony Jaa, he does. I'm one of my favorite uh, martial arts. Uh, Tony Jaa? Yeah. That guy's really, really impressive. That guy's really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some people were saying, I don't I don't believe anything. I think they was like, he's not a real fighter. What do you think? I think that, well, to be a fighter, yeah. you have to have fights. Fight, have fight, exactly. Right? Yeah, like, I agree. You can be, like, there's so many people, because some people are like, oh, well, he's such a good martial artist. Uh, you know, look at what he can do in the gym. Of course, he'd be good at fighting. That's not true, right? Because right? when you're actually in a fight, you don't know yeah, what fight. what part of your brain is going to be accessed at that right. point, you know. And you see this in MMA all the time. You have people who are super talented in certain areas, or they're very, very good in the gym, and maybe they've won some, they've done well at like the lower levels, but they get into the upper levels. And there is this fighter out of out of Vegas who is always known as being a, a terrifying gym partner. Uh-huh. Where he would he would just be he beat the shit out of everybody. You right. you think you're the dude in New York? You come to Vegas, you're getting you're getting fucked up by this dude. But he got so comfortable. This is my opinion. Uh-huh. He got so comfortable being the bully that he didn't understand that that when he actually got into real competition and those same dudes he was beating up mm-hmm. could turn were they're like no this is for, I'm not we're not practicing. Right. You may have beat me up when we were practicing. Right. I'm not playing now. He it's, never got to practice with a realistic look. He never right. got to gauge. So he was, there were certain things built into his style. I mean, but this is a pretty common. We have people who are really, really good in the gym, and for whatever reason, it doesn't translate. Right. And when they get it, it right. just, you know, so, and you've got to actually compete and see what kind of results you get when you actually compete. And that's how you know. But I mean, if you fight, you're a fighter. Like, you go on a common, you go on stage as a comedian, you're a comedian. You know what I mean? Right. You oh, might yeah. not be a good comedian, right. but you're you're in the club. You're doing it. You know, mm-hmm. you got to do it to do it. Right. So, 
I I don't know. I know you could, but you could say he's a very talented martial artist. He's a phenomenal actor, right. and a stuntman. I mean, because that man. guy was interesting because he brought Muay Thai into the kung fu world. Yes, he did. And no one had seen that style of choreography for fights before. You know, no one has seen a kickboxer was supposed to be about Muay Thai. Van Damme didn't do a single Muay Thai move that mm-hmm. entire movie. Right. He's did, nobody learns Muay Thai by training with some kung fu master in right, the jungle exactly. punching trees. Right. You know, that's like a. I used to like watch Van Damme. I always thought he was. Uh, very, very flexible, you know. Well, don't get me wrong. I love those Van Damme movies. Bloodsport's right. one of my favorite. Oh movies yeah, yeah. Ever. Sport, Kickboxer's yeah. amazing. But what? But Van Damme wasn't even a martial artist at first. Right. I think he came from a dancing background. Yeah, yeah dancing back ballet. So did Jackie Chan. Oh yeah. And Chan, no, no, no. David Carradine. Oh yeah. yeah David cool. Carradine was a dancer, and so he just learned basically choreography stage blocking right. or whatever he just learned the movement for so he picked up martial arts very quickly right. you know I think that uh, I, don't, I don't know what Tony Jaw's background and Jet Li's another one oh, yeah, Steven yeah, yeah. Seagal's another one yeah. you know these guys who they are legitimate martial artists right. but you know we talk about fighting all. that's the question that's the problem when people talk about Bruce Lee say oh how would Bruce Lee do in the UFC well first of all Bruce Lee's 125 pounds they don't really have his weight class on thirty five. Well, they they no, they did got it, but he'd be like in the he'd be fighting like Mighty Mouse. Mm-hmm. You know Mighty Mouse, uh, Demetrius Johnson. Oh, yeah, little, little dude. Yeah, yeah, little guy from uh, yeah. Washington. He, well, he, he's hailed as one of the most technically sound talent. Like he just doesn't make any mistakes in his right. technique. But we don't know how Bruce Lee would have done in that rule set, and we also we don't really know so much of Bruce Lee's is folklore. Mm-hmm. We witnessed a lot of stuff, but nobody really witnessed him whooping anybody's ass. Well, um, if, if if you uh, look at a video of uh, your man, uh, uh, Robert Wall, who who, who's, um, who who played O'Hara in Into the Dragon, said on the set, dude's messing with talking stuff, and he said, Bruce Lee, well, come on down here. Yeah. So he's, uh, he stopped Bruce Lee, got mad, opened, bah, 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 blood up and said, get back up on the wall. They was like, I believe that stuff because when you see his choreography, the, the mm-hmm. opening scene of In the Dragon where he's sparring right. with the other monks, the the way it, it's it's a mm-hmm. very theatrical version of modern mixed martial arts. Mm-hmm. We have certain strikes, certain counters. He sees things coming. It all goes with his philosophy. I used to read that Dao Jeet Kune Do book. Yeah, his, I his, had his that book. book. He's more of a like Bruce Lee had a degree in philosophy, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had this conversation before. Yeah. <laughs> Because when I read that book, I thought, I thought he was crazy. I threw it down. Like, hey, this dude was goofy, man. Right. But I reread. I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me I reread and I understood it. One of my favorite Bruce Lee quotes, he says, when I see an opportunity, I do not strike. I he, hit with all. It's, 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 he it, goes, it, it strikes it, all by itself. itself. Right. right. Because you clear, right. it's the Taoist philosophy of right. you clear your brain, you, you take away your ego, you take away... Anything that could just anything that could be in between knowing what to do and actually doing the thing, and you just react Mm -hmm. to stuff. And that was you see that in all his choreography. Bruce Lee has some of the most interesting fight choreography, I think, Mm -hmm. in all of martial arts because he was super mixed. I mean, he finishes Mm -hmm. the guy with a with a a very fancy looking, but it's a crucifix submission. I mean, it's a real submission. Mm -hmm. He did it upside down, which look I don't know how you'd make that actually work in real life, but. And, you know, he took a real thing. He made he dressed it up for Hollywood a little bit, mm-hmm. but that whole exchange with uh, that guy he was sparring with in the beginning of you know, the dragon in, into the dragon is very mixed martial arts. I mean, and of there's course, a and lot of, course, of you different know, that's stuff. Sammo Hung, a young Sammo <laughs> that Hung. That was the guy he beat up with Sammo. Yeah, yeah, Sammo oh, Hung. Okay, he, yeah, that's what I thought. Because I was looking and I, I bet somebody some money. I said that's Sammo Hung. It was like, how you know? I said I can tell somebody is young. That's just like Kurt Russell was in the movie. With Elvis Presley, I said, I look at his eyes. Kurt Russell known for his beautiful blue eyes. I said, I know that's him. And I looked at people like he was right. Wow. And that's what I, people was like. You always had that keen eye. You, you recognized know? his eyes. Yeah, I recognized. And just like I, I was looking at, I said, that's Samuel Hung. And Momo was like, you right, baby. And then he he, he said on the interview, he said, yeah, I was an into dragon. That was me. And I know Jackie Chan was uh was, was into the dragon. Jackie uh, Chan was in the other yeah, day? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was he? Uh, I forget. That. I think he was like an ex, one of those uh, five guys. And yeah. also, uh, he was also in um, 
in Chinese Connect, they showed his face. He was very young. Yeah. And he had said, I think I was looking at some special with Jackie Chan. <coughs> I think he had got a plate in his head because he had felt like some feet. And, Bruce, oh, and he was in the man. hospital. Bruce was like, man, you ain't got it. He said, no, nah, I'm going to stay. Because he, he was in the hospital. He said, he said well, I'm, I'm being able to continue. Just let me uh, get. He was like, Bruce Lee had his most respect. Jackie Chan is a crazy dude. Yeah. He does all of his own stunts, Stunts. even if he's got broken stuff on him. Right. He choreographs all this stuff. I watched a little documentary once on Jackie Chan's stunt crew. where He he just runs like a team of stuntmen, and they just do all these. This really cool thing where, like, say there's a thing where a guy, like, does the kung fu move where he sweeps the leg, you know? And Jackie Chan's like, how do we make this more theatrical? It's like, okay, well, off camera, we're going to tie the guy's, we're going to tie a rope around the guy's foot. And so when I do the kick, you, you guys off camera yank the dude's foot out so his foot really flies, you know, and it really looks like you you swept him way extra hard. Like if you watch those Jackie Chan movies, they do crazy stuff like that. Jackie Chan's a real a real innovator. I didn't realize that all of them were in End of the Dragon. You know who I love is Bolo. Oh yeah, Bolo, Bolo Young, Young yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, because he was he in, was a he, Chinese Hercules. He was so oh, cock diesel. He was a bodybuilding champion. Yeah, he was. And uh, I guess he did some martial arts because he's got real like you can see his form and stuff. You're like, okay, well, this guy's obviously trained some martial and arts. He liked he liked Tai Chi the best. I didn't know that. Huh? Yeah, he he was uh, the bad guy in uh, in in uh, Bloodsport too. That's yeah, all yeah, I know yeah, about. Yeah. He's so big. He was basically Goro. They must have based Goro from Mortal Kombat off of Bolo. Yes. You know? Bolo was just, he's tough. Um, he was the first, like, real muscle man, like, real jacked muscle dude who did Kung Fu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, didn't really yeah, see yeah. that much. Now we, we got, like, Michael J. White. Woo! Man. Now that's a bad motherfucker. That guy oh, could probably. Oh, my gosh. Man. You don't want to mess with him in the dark alley, man. Have you seen that clip of him talking to Kimbo Slice about the punch? I saw that, yeah. That's cool, right? Right. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Michael J. White explaining timing of punches, right. and he's well, like, "Do the hand like yeah, that." Yeah, he's like, yeah. he's like, "All right, I'm gonna punch your hand, and now move it in the first two, He goes real fast, and he, he he moves his hand out of the way real fast, moves his hand out of the way. Third, now watch this. The third one, watch. He goes, "Bop," and goes right to it. And the timing, just that example, like what a masterful understanding of of how timing works and how to offbeat somebody in fighting. Mm. That guy, that guy really knows his shit. Yes. And uh, Joe Rogan always talks about it. he was the guy that kicked the bag off the ceiling in the I think it was the Bomb Squad back in the the original Tenth Planet headquarters <clears throat> in uh, Hollywood. Who you, who, who you talking about, Joe Rogan? Did? Well, d- d- Michael J. White did, yeah. but I think Rogan was there or heard the story. I, I heard the story from Rogan, but you know I don't know. He has, don't you? Michael J. White, he's he got eight black belts. Yeah, I believe it. Oh, well, he did a lot of karate fights. Yeah. Right? So, right. but as Koju far as karate, like... <clears throat> Koju karate. So, no, I don't know. He, so I don't know about Tony Jaw. I don't know if he was actually... Because yeah. he seems like more of a choreographer yeah. than a knock moy, which is what we would call a Thai yeah. boxer. Because he only does the craziest Thai stuff. Because in the movies, right? So he's only doing right. the flashiest moves. What do you say he studied Thai? Uh, a Muay Thai. Oh, obviously. He yeah. obviously studied... I mean, his whole... That first, what was that first movie he did? Ung Bak. Ung Bak, yeah. Right. That movie was really like a, I said it again, that movie was very much a commercial for Muay Thai mm-hmm. within the world of Kung Fu movies. Because he's using Muay Thai to beat up all these other fighters. And it was like, do you, I, do you remember this movie? This is a deep cut. Do you remember this movie, Only the Strong? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah. And that was Capoeira. It was the same yeah, idea, yeah, right? Capoeira, yeah. <clears throat> the Brazilian dance fighting. Like yeah. when when I t- in I Zoolander, was like, they're breakdance fighting. That's Capoeira, yeah. really. That's what the original breakdance fighting is. Eddie yeah, Gordo. Yeah. yeah, Eddie Gordo, yeah. Yeah, that was what that was. But it was like, it was the whole movie was sort of a, uh, it was showcasing this style of fight they say we're going to do a whole movie where the hero does just this one style of fighting and is different than what the other guys do except maybe at the end he fights someone who also knows it but they're a bad guy and then he has to have a you know a kung fu that was old on the strong I used to watch that shit all the yes. time my sister and I used to watch that yeah. we used to watch because I got really obsessed with capoeira I decided I wanted yeah. to get really good at a martial art before I was a fighter I'd done some taekwondo and I just got it in my head I wanted to just Take, you know, a few months 
or whatever and just study one martial art and get really, really, really good wow. at it. And I believed, which is still kind of true, but that it wasn't really about the style of fighting that you used. It was about how you practiced it. Right. So Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Aikido, all of these things have proper context where huh. it's the best thing to use in that situation. Right. Everything has something to offer. You know the story of Capoeira? Uh, well, I know that um, uh, for, for, um, it's the, uh, it was a, a, a style that the Africans made up to get away from the slave master. Yeah, like basically. the chain and stuff like that. And that's, from, that's where hip-hop comes from, of course. And, of course, you know, they sell stories inside of a circle in a cypher. That, you know, they're, 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 they're like a freestyle battle. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Well, because when I, there's that's two, there's, you know. there's a couple, there's the Angola style and mm-hmm. the Hijanal style of yes. Capoeira. And the Angola style especially yeah. is very slow. It's like yoga that moves. Yeah. It's all the same moves, but they do it mm-hmm. slow. It's crazy. But they're always playing music. Yes. They always play. They get the barren bow or the brown, 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 they like, mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, but that, that was the idea, right? Because the slaves weren't allowed to practice martial arts, uh-huh. obviously, because they're slaves. We don't want them. So they mm-hmm. created a style of martial arts that was designed like a dance slash game. Because martial arts is a dance, if you see like how you do. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's designed that way. It's designed, but also, also, have you seen capoeira knockouts in MMA? Because there's some capoeistas. There's some dudes who mostly do capoeira, and they probably practice Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu and stuff mm-hmm. as well. But their thing is capoeira. And some of those dudes, this dude doing the Jenga, the side to side thing, Jenga. and he throws out three. The, how they'll just do like spin kick, spin kick, mm-hmm. spin kick. It looks exactly like Eddie Gordo. He knocks the shit. Out of you. you gotta look up some mm-hmm. way to knockouts on YouTube because uh. it doesn't seem like it would be a valid style. Mm-hmm. It really doesn't. But with all the movement, it makes you hard to hit. It makes right. you small. You protect your elbows. Right. If your hands are bound, right? That's why the Jenga is shaped like this. Right, yeah. Because they, I thought it was a beat. I said it's just a good dance. Style. It looks like it, it, right? It looks and like so. I a dude was showing me some style. Like, oh man, he's like, come on, come on, champ. And I was like, and he was doing. I said, he, I'm like, what the hell, this dude is? I said, oh really? Yeah. And the whole and point was, I said, to oh, okay. Now I started now. He had me training a little bit. I was like, hey, I like this. Yeah, they've got they've got very interesting moves because that that yeah. style that step it's like a samba yeah. where you step yeah. to the side, step back. Step to the side, the step back, yeah. boom, and, and, out. and that movement is very rhythmic, very dance like. Yeah. But then you can stutter step it, and you throw kicks and sweeps yeah. and throws and all kinds of crazy stuff in there. And really, high level cowboy is amazing to watch, right? Yes, it is. But to see it translate into a real fight, that's like that Bruce Lee stuff, that Jackie, that Tony Jaw. That's what I'm, uh-huh. where you have something that looks fucking cool, but it actually works really good. Uh-huh. It works almost as well in real life as it does in the movies you know and the dude you know the dude that played um uh, and, and one of um tony Jaa's second movie that that was dope uh i, I think it's called the protector okay the, the one dude with the dread that did capital well he was giving tony Jaa the business he he was in that movie the protector want to play eddie gordo man i said man he was giving tony Jaa the business he was tough boy. yeah that Man, sounds like a that, cool. that was a good movie, The Protector. Muay Thai and versus Capoeira, right? When, 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 when he broke that sink, that was no stunt. I, I didn't his, see that. Woo, he I broke a protect. sink. A, a, a big porcelain You know how strong the sink is? Yeah, it's like he, concrete. Bang, he broke it with his... I was like, oof, gosh. Ouch. Man, what do you think about... Uh, what's that, uh, the other style? Um... Uh, it's I'm trying to think. Uh, not capital. It's the it's the other style. Um, In, from Brazil, South America. Or? No, no, no. Uh, give me a region. I can tell you. Okay, I don't know where it's from. Uh, I know when I say it's, it's like kind of when they can take the guns and stuff like Don't Krav Maga. Krav, Krav Maga. Yeah. yeah, Krav Maga is. The starting point of the when well, I used to do material about yeah. how martial arts are kind of the most racist thing <laughs> ever because every martial art was designed by one tribe right. who was getting killed by another tribe, and so it's like, no, we need to kill all of the people right. in that country with Krav our Maga. bare hands. Well, <coughs> Krav Maga is a style of 
functional like survival martial art right mm-hmm. where you're dealing with multiple people right. it's a life or death like you don't kick anyone in the head and cry right. maga unless right. they're on the ground right that's that's real fighting right that's survival right. fighting right that's like the bruce lee stuff i mean bruce right. lee can kick in the head different but mm-hmm. he's better at it than most people but the rule is you don't want to be off balance right. especially if you've got more than one person coming at you right and it's the official martial arts style, the Israeli Special Forces. Mm-hmm. Israel. So everyone who goes through the military in Israel, which is right. everyone, they all learn some Krav Maga. Right. And who do the Israelis fight? They was teaching on Sahara. They had a lot of Krav Maga school. I I'm hear it's wondering. very cool. It seems like as far as like if I ever wanted to learn a new martial art, I would want to learn Krav Maga probably because it, it deals with this one element that is always missing from other styles, which is fighting more than one person. Yeah. And fighting for survival. And I kind of, I quit worrying about that when I got out of karate and started yeah. focusing on like jujitsu and, and more yeah. sport based. Yeah. You know, jujitsu is great for survival as I, well, but multiple people is very different. I'm like this, you know, my husband, my philosophy, I just don't believe in trying to fight no four, five dude. Come on, you know, one of them got a knife or they packing with a gun. I'm just being honest. Yeah, out. like how do you even end up in that situation? Right. Like no, you I, did something dumb right. if you have five dudes trying to kick your ass at or, once. Or you running that, your mouth or something. That whole Kung Fu thing where there's the, or the, the, the school, like there's the, the new kid and then you have all the football players and they yeah, surround yeah, yeah. him and like push him around and, and then he has to to figure out a way to get them back and then get the girl. Like, that is fake. That shit doesn't happen. No. That kid deserved to get bullied. Right. If he's he's still on one of these motherfuckers and run. That, that's just got me sick. He might Even Michael been, J. White said that. Dude, I, have you been watching that Jeffrey Dahmer shit? Uh-uh. No, you, I got to look at that. Dude, I, I, I'm, I've been watching it, and it is... Uh, they didn't even beat him up in high school. He was totally weird. You know yeah. what I mean? They just let him kind of be that. And they tease him a little bit, but it's mostly like just all right. There, there was this idea of the because when I was a kid, I was doing karate because I assumed that it was like the TV shows. Right. And at some point in my life, I don't know when, but at some point in my life, there's going to be like a bunch of other bigger kids and who fuck with you. and, and we all have to fight at once. And I never, I've never been in a fight without a referee ever. For real? Never. Oh, never. man. I, I've Lucky always, you. Well, I think it was the early Never no school fights? Never. I got beat up a couple of times, but I never really oh, fought okay. back. Oh, okay. Well, well, I... I didn't, I didn't oh, have... Shit. I'd, like, have a bigger kid who, like, rough... But I never really got hurt getting beat up. So I didn't really understand. I never really took, like, Ooh. a real beating until I started fighting competitively. Right. And then, you know, in the gym and... Right. You know, competition. Ooh, baby. But yeah, I, I've never. But the thing is, is that since I've learned how to fight, and I don't have this like sort right. of this fear, anxiety about the idea of that. I've never. I, it's so easy not to. Right. It's so much easier not to than it is to. All right, Even exactly. though it's easy to do it, it's so much easier to just say, okay, I'm going to walk somewhere else. How about this? I'm going to go. You feel however you feel. And right. I'm going to go. I'm going to go exist. Elsewhere. Oh, oh, elsewhere. Yeah, and, and I that, that was my thing coming up. I I, I had this high temper, and I I used to get jumped on by by gang. I got jumped on by gang members. You know. So that's just I was describing. Fall. That kind of oh, yeah. happened to you, where you'd have yeah, guys who are like, you hey, know. we're gonna beat up right. Right, because he, he, because they thought I was because I was hanging with gang bangers back in the day. I'm gonna keep it real. In my uh my early uh freshman year of high school in the early eighties, I was. Hang with some, they thought I was a gangster disciple and I was getting jumped on and they hooked and I fighting stuff like that. One at a time, running home, I'm like, oh shit, you know, being honest, or, you know, dudes see me in a different neighborhood, talking, what's up, homie, trying to take my shoes and my jacket, got my jacket stole before I got beat up by four dudes. Just being, they had to do a lot of humbugging. Fight some dudes, he fucking my sister, pow, you know, stole on we, we squaring up, it's on. Wow. Yeah, I, I did a lot of scrapping back in the day. So Ashley, I, uh, Ashley Carlisle calling you. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'll get her back. <laughs> All right, but yeah, man, I did a lot of humbug, you know. But you know, like I'm, I'm glad I survived. I'm here. Thank goodness. Woo. All right, so I take back what I said before. It's just not something I ever had to do, but I, um, but like that. I guess that situation does happen uh-huh. in. In real life, because yeah, yeah, I guess people, because you know, there's a lot of that. That I hear that story a lot, where people 
certain neighborhoods. Yeah, I got bullied. Areas. Mike Tyson got. I didn't know he got bullied like that. I saw that message on Hulu. Oh, that, you know uh, he got bullied. You watch how he whoops those people. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, know, you see he, how good he fights. You're like, oh, yeah. that guy. That guy knows. How yeah. that guy knows what it's like to lose, and yeah. he don't ever want that to happen again. That's yeah. how hard he trained. Yeah, he, 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 and trust me, when I found out his workout regimen, I said, "Ooh wee," and Hershey Walk was another one, cause uh, I thought I was the push up king, cause I was doing like four five hundred. Hershey Walk was doing fifteen hundred. I said, "Ooh shit." A day? Well, yeah, he was doing it thirty five hundred crunches. Mike Tyson was doing twenty five hundred crunches. He would take that. 60 pound kettlebell, do shoulder shrugs, like a 500 of them. He would do 2,500, 2,000 squats. I'm like, man, what? God damn, no wonder his legs are so big. Yeah. It doesn't even seem real, those numbers. I think about like reps. I do timed reps. So I'll right. set like a timer for a minute and I'll yeah. just do one thing for that minute. And then right. I'll do another thing for that minute. And it's that, that keeps me from getting bored. Yeah, yeah. Stop, oh, yeah. I get bored you know? quick. I know, but I get bored quick. But you know, I like doing a little lighter weight and high repetition. I like doing that. That that works for me. I mean, yeah, you feel better, you feel faster. Um, all right. Well, Ray, uh, we've been going two and a half hours. Damn, I know it's been a minute. I'm like, man, we will been up here for a minute. Damn. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? Because I think I gotta. We gotta. Yeah. Take care of some business after this. Oh uh, no, I, I gotta get going. I, I got. I know you gotta take care of some business. So do I. No, that's pretty much it. Just uh, check out your boy Ray Love if you can. All right, you're going to be performing them tonight or tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow Me, night. Sean Fitzsimmons and D.S. Mackey. We're going to be performing for my guy, Mr. Roman Stern. Where's that going to be? Uh, it's going to be at some peop- some friend's house, and we're going to be at... Oh, it's a house show. Yeah, 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 a show at a house. It's going to be at... In Henderson, at eighty-eight Vital Avenue. Yeah, eighty-eight Vital Avenue in Henderson. Okay. Eight nine. Is like an open. Is an open thing. I don't want you to no, 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 invite no, no, no. everybody to a no, no, no. party. He, he he sent me to it. It's it's a Clay's backyard skin comedy show. All right. Yeah, this is it. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you got a flyer and everything. Yeah. Do you gotta buy tickets for that. Uh, it's ten dollars. No, you can go on Vino. Okay. Yeah. Tomorrow, cool. October the first. Man, Man, I might first try to October. Cut. I want to check that out. Fitzy never tells me about the really cool stuff that he does. Oh, okay. You know, is, 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 is he still doing his show? Matter of fact, uh, I'm booked at Chonkless on my birthday on uh, November the 9th. Awesome. Yeah, and then Fitzy had booked me. Thank goodness he booked me uh, the eighth uh, at a, at a, um. Fitzy and friends. Fitzy and friends yeah, for the eighth on Tuesday. So Tuesday I'm working there. And then on my birthday on November the 9th next month, well, uh, I'm going to be at uh, Chocolate's headline. Great, man. So, yeah, so I'm just doing my thing. That's awesome. All right, well, check out Ray Love. Also, if uh, you need any with your business. Clean window. Ray Love Window Clean Service. Ray Love Window Clean Service. You can contact him at hook you up with a house At gmail.com or Ray Shines Windows. R-A-Y. S H I N E S W I N D O W S at gmail.com. All right, cool. Ray Love, thank you so much for coming by, man. This has been a lot of fun. We're going to get you back yes, with sir. Jay. And uh, that's it. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you around, bro. Hi, peace. Thank you.